everybody. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order for afternoon of November 1st, 2022. Tony, could you please call the roll? Jimenez. Present. Morales. Here. Cohen. Frosto. Present. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Foley. Here. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Licardo. Present. You have a quorum. All right, thank you. If you're able to stand, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm honored to have uh, our invocator join us today. Uh, Reverend Steve Kingston has served this community in many ways at Maranatha Church here in San Jose, as well as Christian Service Director at Bellerman uh, and teacher. Uh, and Councilmember Mayhan will tell us more. I heard he was your teacher, Mayor. Well, uh, we won't go into that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he might. <laughs> Reverend Steve Pinkston, thank you so much for being here today. It's my honor to welcome you and introduce you this afternoon. We really appreciate you being with us to do the invocation. Reverend Pinkston has been a high school teacher, coach, and administrator for the past 42 years. He began teaching at Bellarmine College Prep in 1980, where I attended in the late 90s. And uh, Bellarmine will always have a special place in my heart, but Reverend Pinkston will, especially for the way in which he kindly and gently but firmly challenged all of us to live up to our values, especially that difficult value of our school motto to be men and women for others. His dedication to serving the community through promoting service learning, coordinating and supporting local and foreign immersion experiences, and advancing social justice as the Christian service director within the school community was truly inspiring. Reverend Pinkston also served as the moderator for Bellarmine's Black Student Union and the Agape Service Club. And as if his tireless efforts were not enough within just the Bellarmine community, he, serves and, he served and continues to serve as an associate pastor at the Maranatha Christian Center in San Jose, where he coordinates the prison and jail outreach ministries. Reverend Pinkston, welcome and thank you so much for leading our invocation today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, Council members, it is good to be with you this afternoon. Let us pray. Loving and great God, we thank you for your presence here this afternoon. We thank you for your goodness. We look outside and see the rain and we thank you for that. Lord, we even thank you for Project Home Key and the progress that's being, been made with that as that will be discussed this afternoon. Lord, help us to reflect on the words, the challenging words by the prophet Micah, to seek justice, to always love mercy, to walk humbly with you and with others. Lord, we are ch even challenged by the words of the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She said, let us heed the words to do something outside of ourselves, something to repair the tears and the tears in our community, to do something to make life a little better for people less fortunate than us, to do something that makes a difference. Thank you, Lord. Now bless the meeting, bless those in attendance, whether they're here or whether on Zoom. We pray this through your lovely and great name, you the omnipotent one, and all said, amen. Thank you, Reverend Pinkston. All right, uh, we'll start with a few ceremonial items before we get into today's work. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco will join me at the podium to recognize and proclaim Alzheimer's Disease Awareness Month.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, proclaim Alzheimer's Awareness Month in the month of November. <clears throat> this, this has a special meaning for me because uh, many of you know my father died of complications of Alzheimer's. Uh, approximately 6 million people in the U.S. currently have Alzheimer's disease, and the number of Americans with Alzheimer's is projected to triple to 16 million by 2050. And according to us against Alzheimer's, more than $250 billion is spent annually in out-of-pocket health care for Alzheimer's uh, patients which is more than 179 times the amount spent on finding a cure. Us Against Alzheimer's also adds that the total annual out-of-pocket payments in the U.S. for health care, long-term care, and hospice care for people with Alzheimer's and other dementias are projected to reach $1.1 trillion by 2050 if we don't develop a treatment or cure. Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disease that slowly destroys memories and thinking skills. This disease debilitates the individual, and in advanced stages, symptoms can include confusion, mood, and behavior changes, and an inability to care for oneself and perform basic life skills. It ultimately results in the death of an individual. And being witness to someone suffering with this disease is incredibly difficult. I've often said, that I find Alzheimer's to be about one of the cruelest diseases that we have as it robs you of who you are and of those memories that you share with your loved ones. Alarmingly, the CDC states that about 80% of folks afflicted with dementia are being taken care of by a family member or a friend. And it's especially heartbreaking to reflect on this, seeing that often you share this family uh, loyalty and re uh, relationships and memories with those that you're taking care of. I'd like to take a moment to thank those caregivers who are taking care of our loved ones, whether it's in a formal space or an informal space. It's very, very difficult for the caretaker. And according to the CDC, family caregivers of people with Alzheimer's and related dementias are at greater risk for anxiety, depression, and poor quality of life than caregivers of people with other conditions. Uh, I, I know this all too well. As I mentioned, my father battled uh, Alzheimer's for 10 years. The last two years of his life, he was almost entirely bedridden. And my father, uh, I, I can't say enough of my, of my father. We had a very special relationship. I was an only child, so we were very close. But he was very kind. He was very generous. He rarely, rarely ever raised his voice uh, at me, uh, including during those very difficult teenage years. Uh, and when I look back on our time together as we were caring for him, I don't think I would have changed anything other than maybe have a bit more support to do so. The financial cost of caring for my father was, uh, it was something else. Uh, on occasion, it pushed us to make very difficult decisions as, as to whether we provided recreational enrichment activities for my children or whether we bought his medication. It was a her Herculean effort to take care of my father, and it took four adults, my mother, myself, my husband, and my ex-husband, who would travel almost on a daily basis from Sacramento to help me care for my dad. As his only child, raising infants and teenagers, this was an unsustainable situation. It's heartbreaking. It's truly heartbreaking to see uh, what it does to the person and what it does to the family members. While, while there's no certain way to prevent Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia research, researchers from the NHS have good evidence to suggest that a healthy lifestyle, including mental exercise like puzzles, reading, and even being bilingual or multicultural can help reduce your risk of developing dementia when you're older. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that by sharing our stories and rallying and support, no one will have to suffer from dementia or from Alzheimer's at some point in our lifetime. And in this battle, we have great allies, including the receivers of today's proclamation. I'm so glad that you're all here. The Alzheimer's Association of Northern California and Northern Nevada. The Northern California and Northern Nevada chapter consists of 11 offices serving communities as far 
south as Monterey and Fresno counties and as far north as the borders of California and Nevada. Since its founding in 1981, the Northern California Northern Nevada chapter has grown into one of the largest in the Alzheimer's Association 78 chapter network. 11 offices serve population centers like Silicon Valley and San Francisco and smaller communities like Reno, Chico, and Monterey. Each year, the chapter serves thousands of families through the 24-7 helpline, one-on-one -on -one care consultation, and more than 150 support groups. And I encourage anyone that is going through this with their family to reach out and get the support that, that is uh, uh, widely available to you. You want to just add that in the latest fiscal year, the Northern California and Northern Nevada chapter raised more than $14 million for Alzheimer's research. I want you to join me in giving these angels a huge applause. And as the mayor... Yes. And I'd like to invite you to come and say a few words. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's going to be hard not to cry after that because we've been through this. So my name is Louise Sumter, and I'm a local volunteer from the Alzheimer's Association. I'm currently the primary care for my father, who is living with Parkinson's. But before that, I led our family care team. You know, I thought I was prepared for this. Sorry. <laughs> For my mother, who lived with Alzheimer's for 10 years and died in 2014. Uh, my name is Rosa Alonso, and I'm also a local volunteer with Alzheimer's Association. My mother has Alzheimer's. It's my first time caring for someone with this disease. It was very hard for me until I, a friend told me about the Alzheimer's Association. The Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Association gave me the information and support to help me a lot. So I'm now a volunteer to, other, to help other caregivers. It is our greatest honor to accept the proclamation on behalf of the Alzheimer's Association and all of the constituents in San Jose and to thank Councilman Carrasco and the entire council for your leadership in raising awareness of the Alzheimer's and dementia. I just want to say this year our walk, just the Silicon Valley walk, is number one in the nation and we've raised over 1.6 million dollars. So that's a big thing. More than 35,000 people in Santa Clara County are living with Alzheimer's. And that number is expected to be more than double to 82,000 in just 20 years. Among the Latino Californians, Alzheimer's will more than triple during that same time. So Alzheimer's affects blacks and uh, Latinas more than whites. The Alzheimer's Association provides a lot of programs and services in many languages to help those affected by Alzheimer's and dementia, and education, caregiving, trainer, and support. And we advocate for more funding for Alzheimer's and dementia research and policies to help caregivers in Washington, D.C., and all the state capitals and health systems around the country. Thank you for all your leadership in raising awareness about Alzheimer's and, correct, and connecting San Jose residents to Alzheimer's information, care, and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Spars is making her way down, and I'm going to invite our chief, and I believe our assistant chief is here as well, 
and as well as uh, James Gin Shapiro. Melissa, thank you, uh, leaders from our district attorney's office. Welcome. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and start while folks make their way down. On the afternoon of Tuesday, September 22nd, San Jose police officers responded to a domestic violence call on Mallot Drive in the Stonegate neighborhood in District 7. They found a woman who had been assaulted, threatened, and choked, and a man who answered the door with a gun in his waistband. Police were able to obtain a gun violence restraining order under California's red flag law and returned with a warrant discovering two dozen guns and evidence of an illegal gun manufacturing operation. Thanks to the diligent actions of the officers, including obtaining and utilizing the gun violence restraining order, they were able to ensure the safety of the domestic violence, uh, excuse me, the domestic violence survivor and ensure a clearly dangerous man was apprehended and did not have the opportunity to retaliate with even greater violence. They also prevented untold future tragedies through shutting down this illegal ghost gun operation. In 2014, in the aftermath of the horrific mass shooting in Isla Vista near the UC Santa Barbara campus, California became one of the first states to pass a red flag law, allowing law enforcement and family members to apply for gun violence restraining orders to keep guns out of the hands of those at serious risk of using them for violence against others or themselves. And in 2019, the state legislature and Governor Newsom expanded this law with the passage of AB 61, allowing employers and educators to apply for GVROs as well. While this law is in effect statewide, it's up to local jurisdictions, the local jurisdictions to educate communities about the use of gun violence restraining orders and then put them to use to keep our communities safe. And our Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office, our own city attorney's office, and the San Jose Police Department have been statewide leaders in this effort. In the last several years, Santa Clara County has been one of the top three counties in the state in obtaining gun violence restraining orders, along with San Diego County and Orange County. So far this year, SJPD has obtained 73 gun violence restraining orders. That's 73 potential tragedies averted. As we continue to grapple with a nationwide epidemic of gun violence that all too often hits close to home, we recognize that this is one of the best and most effective tools we have to keep guns out of the hands of those most likely to cause harm and help prevent these tragedies. The, effect, the effective use of gun violence restraining orders here in San Jose is largely due to the strong partnership and efforts between the district attorney's office that has championed their use and helped educate our local law enforcement agencies and our San Jose Police Department, which continues to utilize this tool to great effect, as we saw with this case in District 7. And I'd like to recognize Assistant District Attorney James Gibbons Shapiro and Supervising Deputy District Attorney Marissa McGown, who are with us today, for their tireless work and leadership in making GVROs a critical part of our toolbox in addressing gun violence. Your partnership has been essential in allowing us to become a state leader and model for the successful use of GVROs. I'd also like to recognize Chief Mata and Assistant Chief Joseph for their leadership in making GVROs part of our police department's toolkit, as well as working to educate our officers and our community members about the use of GVROs and the role that they play in preventing tragedies. And a big thank you to our team at the city attorney's office who play an important role in this life-saving partnership. I'm so honored to present this commendation today, recognizing this important partnership between the San Jose Police Department, our city attorney's office, and the office of the district attorney. And I'd like to invite Marissa and Chief Mata to come up and please say a few words.
I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about something that I've been passionate about since 2016. Um, I think that this tool, this red flag law, the gun violence restraining order law absolutely saves lives and it was only a matter of education and informing members of the public and our police department about what it is and how it works that led to its huge use and rollout and incredible success stories in this city. And honestly, this police department has been a partner since the beginning. I've trained personally, I think, every single member of the San Jose Police Department at this stage, um, going to all the academies and patrol briefings to spread the word. And once they heard about it, it was used in cases like the case on Mallet Drive that you just heard about with incredible results in disarming individuals who are at risk of harming themselves and others. And so. It can be done. Um, this is just a matter of understanding and using this incredibly powerful tool to get guns out of the hands of individuals who are suicidal, who have threatened to do harm, and who have raised a red flag based on their behavior. So I'm really grateful to this city, as always, for being leaders in this space. I'm really grateful for the recognition, but also for our police department and our city attorneys who over and over are partners. And the fact that we hold hands on issues like this means that we are keeping this city safe day after day. So thank you especially to Nora, our city attorney, who was at one of those very early meetings in the early days. And I just want to say, when we did our first gun violence restraining order here, you know, we kind of faked our way through it because we hadn't been done before. And you can do that. The first time I got a call about one of these, it was in the midst of a hot call. There was an individual um, who was threatening to shoot police officers who was driving up from San Benito County into our county. And his wife had alerted the authorities. And and I remember getting a call from the officer who said, we got to do one of those gun violence order things. And I said, I don't know what that is. And he's like, Google it. And he hung up. And no joke, we Googled it. And so I'm here to say, if you ever don't know how to do something, you can Google it and you can figure your way out. So uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And there's a bunch of will here. So thank you to everybody for everything we've done on this. Thank you, Member, uh, Council Member Esparza, for uh, the commendation uh, and recognizing our officers, as has already been mentioned. A special thanks to uh, Nora and the City Attorney's Office who have paved the way for us to provide us this tool. And again, uh, the partnership that we have with the District Attorney's Office to train uh, our officers who are in the middle of the night or at any time of the day, they're able to get uh, the gun violence restraining order, to get the guns off the hands of uh, the folks that should not have these these weapons and can cause uh, further harm. But again, thank you for, for that. Uh, and just a, as a quick, uh, a quick uh, stats, back in 2018, we had uh, very few restraining orders. Last year, we had over 50. And as Council Member Esparza mentioned, uh, we have over 70 uh, gun violence restraining orders that our officers have obtained, again, to get illegal guns or guns off the hands of individuals that uh, are potentially, can, can harm our community. So. Again, thank you, Councilmember Sparza, and uh, everyone here at the city, uh, uh, city, um, city manager's office, city attorney's office, and the council, and, and supporting our police department and providing us this opportunity. So, thank you. Thank you to our partners at the DA's office, and particularly Marissa and James for their hard work. And I uh, also want to thank, um, some people might think this is an imposter who's our assistant chief, but in fact, Paul just is undercover today uh, with a mustache. <laughs> All right, uh, we're on to, I think, Councilmember Perales, who I meet, I believe is virtual, is that right? Okay, he is. Uh, we're going to recognize and commend Scott Neese. And um, for those who missed, what was kindly called the exit revenue, uh, exit interview. <laughs> I guess it was more of a roast. Uh, <laughs> Scott, Scott has been just an incredible leader uh, for our downtown now for more than three decades. So incredibly grateful for his service, his leadership, and his commitment to our community. Uh, Councilmember Prowls is going to tell us more. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and it's my pleasure to be able to recognize uh, and present Scott with this commendation. And I apologize, I could not be there 
in person, uh, the, the kids and then uh, my, they got me sick, but the, I got two kids at home sick and, and now, and I guess that's how it transfers over to the, to the parents. Now that everybody's back in school, um, we went a couple years without having a cold um, and now we can't go a couple weeks. So, uh, but uh, Scott, you know about that and it's a, a pleasure to be able to, to recognize you and, and everything that you've done for our community today um and and share a little bit i know uh i wasn't able to attend the roast either um but i was able to, to, to share some words uh virtually uh there and and i'll share a little bit here as well uh, so scott has been a longtime resident of san jose and he served the san jose downtown association for more than 34 years he graduated uh, from san jose state university school of journalism where he was a former daily newspaper reporter uh, he was also uh, an active downtown business owner who eventually was hired in 1987 as the first executive director for the San Jose Downtown Association. The San Jose Downtown Association represents more than 2,100 businesses, nonprofits, and property owners who work collaboratively to enhance the downtown experience and to help make downtown a better place. And under Scott's leadership, SJDA developed several iconic projects that included the Sofa Pocket Park, the launch of the property-based Improvement District or PBID, which I would say is, is, is uh, maybe one of the, the uh, best efforts uh, and one that we see today helping to keep downtown clean um, and, uh, and beautify our streets and our sidewalks. And, uh, and I know personally having known and worked with Scott for many years now, I can personally speak to his commitment in bettering and supporting our downtown community and, and our, our greater community as well. And I did get to share these these comments uh, recorded uh, virtually at the roast, um, but these were not so much of uh, the the roast type of comments. But as Scott may recall, uh, a couple years before I was elected for office, I was out exploring uh, the thought of it. And one of the organizations that I came to was the Downtown Association. Came to a meeting, reached out to Scott with an interest to, to be able to learn more about the organization, and uh, and really just in my exploration for for running for council. And I will say Scott was very quick to respond. Uh, in, in just a couple of days, we were having coffee downtown. And uh, at that point, uh, most people were looking at me as, as uh, someone that didn't have a chance at all. And just a, a young kid that, that had an interest at, at running for office. Uh, but Scott really uh, opened up uh, his arms and, and invited me in to understand the organization, was sharing their input and documentation with me, the work that they were doing. Um, what he knew was that anybody could could win that seat for uh, downtown and, and he was doing his part to ensure that everybody was going to be a true advocate for our downtown core and, and really uh, well versed on on the needs and so I, I appreciate that Scott I want to say thank you uh, for opening up uh, that opportunity uh, it was it was very helpful for me as I prepared uh, for my run uh, over nine years ago um, and then the the, the small tit, tidbit of the roast was that um, I offered to, to text him but but Scott was still carrying a phone around that uh, wasn't text worthy um, and so if you if you worked with Scott over the years, uh, it took him a while to come into the 21st century of technology. And so um, emails was was there for him. It was doing well. And, and finally, uh, he upgraded to a smartphone uh, several years ago. So we appreciate that, Scott, being able to communicate with you in the 21st century. Um, but it's, it's been a pleasure uh, to, to work with you. You've had a tremendous 34 year run. Um, and uh, and again, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but thank you to our mayor for being able to present to you uh, this combination for 34 years of service to our downtown uh, in San Jose. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Councilman Perales, for establishing what a Luddite I am. Uh, that is, that's very true. Uh, there are some city staff people here, like myself, that have worked in this community for decades. Um, I've had 19 different board presidents, worked with five mayors, and like our respective organizations, whether it's the, the Downtown Association or you working for the city, the electeds, board, they do the policy and give the direction. We do the work. We get the work done. We are the ones that are the continuity between the different administrations, different board presidents, different mayors. and. I look around at the different cities in the Bay Area and I see dysfunction in San Francisco, Oakland, Richmond, Santa Clara, but not in San Jose. The professional staff here, the leadership here, exemplifies the very best in public service. And 
the way that you partner with community groups and, and nonprofits is also an example of how you leverage the public resources that you have. Because of my position, uh, since downtown San Jose is everybody's neighborhood in the city, I've had the honor of working with almost every facet in the city. PBCE, the library, police, city attorney's office, housing, PRNS, uh, especially DOT and OED and OCA. And I know I just said an alphabet soup of acronyms that most people have no idea what I said. But let me tell you, behind each of those functions are talented and dedicated people that get the work done. And your professionalism has inspired us in the community. You do meaningful work that makes a difference in people's lives every day in this city. It has been my great privilege to work with you for all of these years. Please carry on your great work for this great city. Picture time. I'm going to poke my head up in the back here. Congrats. <laughs> Thanks, man. I have my back to you. <laughs> and if I could just offer a couple words, since I had the pleasure of working with Scott, both as the council member and as a mayor, you know, an awful lot uh, gets taken for granted about what Scott and his small but mighty team have done for our community and the imprint they've left. And, um, you know, Council Member Prowlis mentioned the uh, the PBID and the Groundworks team that we see every day, I mean, that's a great legacy, but so many more great legacies, whether it's music in the park, uh, farmer's market, uh, movie night, or a zombie crawl, or any of the other many amazing things that have happened in our downtown and continue to happen. Uh, really, it's an imprint that's been left by Scott and his, his small team. And I know that uh, Blage Zalalich, uh, who is here now with the city, we're fortunate to have her, uh, was very much a part of that for, for at least a couple of decades. Uh, we're just grateful uh, for all that they do, and I'm grateful to Scott for his, lead, for his leadership and his, for his friendship. Thank you, Scott. All right, let's uh, move on to our final commendation, and I think, is Councilmember Cross going on remotely? Oh, okay, I had... Councilmember Rain is present? Oh, great, thank you. Please forgive me. Good little typo. Okay, that's great. Councilmember Moranis, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that's fine. Just, just read the notes. <laughs> thank you. They say we're cousins, but we're not. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. This is this is something that I always express when I'm at um, the Gurdwara, when I visit the Gurdwara, and we. We uh, pray it's uh, God's pure one, victory to God. Um, and I'm honored uh, to be here today once again to recognize November as Seek Awareness um, and Appreciation Month. And I'm really uh, thrilled to have Sir Sergeet Baines here, who is one of the leaders at, at the Gurdwara. But with him is also Harleen Kaur, Ashdeep Singh Malik, and of course, Harbir Kaur Bhatia. So welcome everybody. This this all really started when Council Member Ash Kalra in 2012 presented the first Sikh American Awareness and Appreciation Month uh, proclamation, and it was a really special moment to not only bring awareness um, about our Sikh community, but also their contributions. Um, and to celebrate diversity and common ground that we have with our neighbors who have been here since, I think it's 1800s, when they helped with lumber mills, farms, railroads, um, and I think agriculture as well. Yes. Uh, Ten years later, with an estimated 700,000 Sikhs, and my uh, honor to have them and celebrate this for, this is now our sixth year together, um, across the country, and despite the long history, there's a lot of folks who don't know much about our Sikh uh, community. And in District 8, we have the home to the largest Sikh Gurdwara, so the biggest uh, temple or church outside of India, um, the Golden Temple. 
and it serves as the primary place of gathering and prayer for the Sikh American community in San Jose and the Greater Bay Area. Um, we continue to proclaim all of November as Sikh American Awareness and Appreciation Month. Um, just last week, we celebrated Diwali, and it was just absolutely beautiful. So this is a, a, a wonderful beginning for our Sikh American Awareness and Appreciation Day. Um, I encourage everyone to visit the Sikh Gurdwara who's in, that is in, uh, in District 8. It is on Gurdwara Avenue, um, which was changed to honor our Sikh community, um, as they have a rich history. They also have a huge heart. Um, they serve langar, which is lunch every day to those folks who are not able to um, eat on their own. Um, when we need something from them, uh, when crisis happens, such as our floods, they're the first ones to offer support during our pandemic. They also were the first ones to call me and say, how can we help? Um, and they serve as critical partners for our, our city of San Jose. Um, in more than ways than one, we have a airport commissioner right next to me. Um, and so their service goes beyond just the Gurdwara. It's my honor to present this proclamation to the San Jose Gurdwara in recognition of uh, Sikh American Awareness and Appreciation Month. And I'm grateful, absolutely grateful, for their continued contributions to our city. And I'd like to welcome Sergi Baines to say a few words on behalf of the Sikh Gurdwara. Wahe Guruji Kalkalsa, Wahe Guruji Kifate. Thank you, uh, Selvia, and all all the uh, all the council members, and also honourable mayor. So, so I just want to thank all of you, and I thank uh, Harveer. She is going to say a few things about our uh, Sikh history, and uh, with that one. So I again thank you for everything to promote the Sikh awareness month, and. Uh, we, we appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit daisy or hazy. I just came back from um, out of country, came back from Ukraine. So this is a perfect uh, day to actually talk about this. So, you know, um, uh, Sikhi was actually uh, founded in Northern India, but it is practiced by people of all races around the world. Often Sikhs are identified by their five articles of faith, which is often, uh, the sixth is considered the turban, as you can see with me. And um, the central pr principle, of course, is that there's oneness amongst all of us, and that we are bounded, bound by that same oneness which creates us and is us. So therefore, we are equal and we should treat each other very well. All deserve equal rights, and therefore, we should remember if we are all the same, I treat you as I treat myself, and if I don't treat you well, I don't treat myself well. These uh, basic principles of service and sarbat tapala, which is uh, really saying the benefit for all beings, really guide our lives and our activities and everything we do. Now, as Sylvia said, Sikhs came in the 1890s, and uh, California was founded in the 1850s, so that's not a lot later than uh, California was founded. It's been a highly productive grassroots organization like other communities have been, and especially in San Jose and California. San Jose is actually home to some of the largest Sikh populations in the United States. I actually uh, live on the border and I serve at the San Jose Gurdwara, but as well as um, community members here. Sikh communities actually worked in side by side with many of the other founding communities of this great state and the city to create a very thriving farming community. They brought the uh, canal systems for irrigation from Punjab, which allowed the Central Valley to be so flourished. Uh, in addition to that, um, as Sylvia mentioned, Sikh, uh, San Jose is, has a larger Sikh Gurdwara in the Western Known Hemisphere. And some of the founders of the high-tech companies live in your neighborhoods here. So some of the most uh, productive members of our so-called Silicon Valley are members of this uh, beautiful city. Um, not only that, but you will find them as entrepreneurs, doctors, scientists, transportation and service members, in addition to public leaders. And today I want to highlight, we also have Harleen Kaur, who is a very 
um, an uh, uh, awarded, highly awarded uh, filmmaker. And so with that, I'd like to say uh, we are part of the family of San Jose, as well as the Bay Area. And we really do want to see that all people do well. And in that tradition, we hope to start the Grunanic Heritage Walk pretty soon, the trail behind the San Jose Gurdwara, so all can benefit. And I, coming back from Ukraine right now, can tell you that whether it's Ukraine, whether it's California, whether it's San Jose, there's violent crimes everywhere. We've seen so many minorities get impacted. For us to wish and, and celebrate Sikh Awareness Month is to really say we must be more united than we've ever been. There's just too much destruction in the world that requires us to be more um, you know, unified on every front, whether it's economy, whether it's climate, whether it's war, whether it's hunger. But truly, we wish for everyone to, to get the benefit of being the human race. And with that, I say thank you very much for this great honor, and we wish everybody well. All right, uh, we will start then on orders of the day. Does anyone in the council have any changes to the printed agenda? <clears throat> I'm going to ask if Tony can see anybody online raising their hand this time. There are no hands. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll be getting logging on in just a moment. Let's go straight to the closed session report. Nora. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. Next is the consent calendar. Are there any items that council would like to pull from consent? All right, I'm not seeing anybody indicating here in chambers. Let's go online. Tony, could you help? Um, I have no council members with hands up. I do have one member of the public. Okay, let's go to the public then. Thank you. Ms. Paul Soto. Hold on, um, my staff is unable to unmute him. Let me try. Okay, it's working for me. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the suffering that the Sikh community had experienced during 9-11 when very ignorant people had, had uh, assumed that the Sikh community um, had some kind of resemblance to those that the United States held responsible for 9-11, and I, I had some friends that were connected to the Sikh community at that time. And so I'd like to acknowledge that community for the suffering that they had experienced during that time period. You are a part of San Jose, and I acknowledge that as a lifelong generational resident of not only San Jose, but California. With respect to the consent calendar, there are, there are items that really actually do need to be pulled, and it's getting really like old. The fact that U10 and the attorneys decide what the public can or cannot comment on or, or, how, or hear a discussion about. I mean, that's like an exercise of power and privilege that I don't really think the voters really were thinking of when they voted you into office because I certainly don't afford you that privilege and, and, and opportunity to do that. Because you're making decisions that have literally generational consequences. And those consequences 
we're starting to like bear the fruit of today. The decisions that were made in 1939 with respect to the redlining map, we're dealing with today. And so it, it, there needs to be some real explanation and accountability with respect to that calendar. Back to the council. Move approval. There's a motion uh, from council members as far as the lift vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go to, first we're going to the study session, I think. Is that right? Okay. Lee says yes. So Rosalind and team are making their way down. Thank you and welcome. Right, so this is a, um, a report on the cost of residential development in San Jose. I think everybody knows why we're here. We've got a housing crisis and we've got to find a way to get housing built uh, and high costs make it challenging. So we're going to learn more. And thank you to our esteemed panelists for helping us uh, in all the ways you've lent your expertise. Uh, who's taking it away? Is it Rosalind? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, members of the public, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. Um, I'm joined this afternoon by Nancy Klein, our Director of uh, the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, Jared Ferguson, our Housing Catalyst, Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director of Housing. Uh, in, the op in the audience, we also have Housing Director Jackie uh, Morales-Ferrand, and we have Michael Brio and Chris Burton from Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Uh, we are also very pleased to be joined by a guest panel uh, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. So today we are pleased to be with you to share the analysis from the updated report on the cost of residential development for both market rate and affordable housing here in the city of San Jose. Previously in 2018 and in 2019, the city council health study sessions, uh, but now we think it's very important to share the updated information uh, and to understand the changes in the market since the pandemic and really to understand how these dynamics can be barriers to housing construction here in the city. Um, so we have a lot of information to share with you today. You'll hear about multifamily construction costs and valuations, you hear about developers' views of risks and returns. Uh, you hear about affordable housing finance. And then you hear about what things the city council as policymakers can and cannot control in this market. Uh, we thought it was important to provide the study session to you um, as uh, in the coming weeks, actually on November 15th, we're gonna be bringing two housing items to you. First, the transition of the housing crisis work plan, which was first uh, approved back in 2018 by the city council and talking about transition, transitioning that work. And then secondly, we'll be bringing an item regarding the residential high rise program uh, for your action. So we are very excited to be joined today by a panel comprised of the Urban Land Institute or ULI San Francisco uh, District Executive Board members. We have Libby Seifel, Eric Tao, who is the current board uh, chair. We have Drew Hadesic, who is the pa past chair uh, of the board. And we're very excited to also be joined by Nevada Merriman, who is director of policy at Midpen Housing. Uh, so first, we'll hear from our panel. Uh, there will be opportunities for the City Council to ask questions and engage um, in discussion, um, after which we have uh, a presentation by City staff. So Jared uh, and Rachel will lead us through that presentation. Again, there'll be another opportunity for the City Council to ask questions and have discussion, uh, followed by public comment. 
Um, and before I hand this over to Eric, um, I just want to share how the city is very appreciative of our continued partnership with ULI San Francisco. They've helped us um, on a number of different projects. Um, they've actually provided uh, training to many uh, city staff a couple of years ago. They have participated in a technical advisory panel on parking um, and also provided an urban plan workshop for public officials. So we're very thankful for this partnership. Want to give a big thanks and shout out to their executive uh, director, Natalie Sandoval, and also their director, Joy Wu, who is also in the audience today. There you are. Uh, so with that, Mayor, I'm going to turn it over to Eric and the panel. Thank you, Rosalind. I'm Eric Tao. I am the current chair of the San Francisco ULI District Council. I'm glad it's not a full house because we don't have all the answers um, for you today. Um, what we're here to do is to work with staff, with Rosen and with you all to try to understand better the challenges and hopefully by understanding the challenges, some solutions to help solve our housing production um, crisis right now. A little bit more about ULI. Uh, Urban Land Institute San Francisco is the name of our District Council, we are more than just San Francisco. We serve the entire Bay Area. We have some of the best and brightest people in real estate, um, getting together, learning best practices regionally, locally, and nationally. We have many, many different programs to try to help share and gather information to arrive at some of those best practices. Today, joining me, oh, I gotta learn to use this thing. There we go. That's some of the things we do. And Rosen touched upon it. We've already done tech, technical assistance panels for the city of San Jose. And again, we continue always to share and gather information about best practices for real estate development and housing development. Our members are comprised by a diverse group of professionals in the development real estate industry, from production to consulting to finance, design. Uh, we talked about what we offer, the public agents. Obviously, staff helped put this slide in to make a larger pitch to you all to continue to work with ULI. Today, as I introduce myself, my name is Eric Ta. I'm a managing partner at L37. We've done housing, all uh, multifamily housing in the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland. Joining us, uh, joining me today is Libby Seifel, founder and president of Seifel Consulting. Libby has advised over 100 different public agencies with a focus on multifamily housing and an emphasis on affordable housing. Also joining me is Drew Hudasik. He's the Chief Investment Officer of Saris Regis. I think many of you know him. Um, Saris Regis has been around since 1993 as a company. Their founders have been doing this for much longer and they've built over 15,000 units of housing in California. So. Everybody in San Jose City Council now probably have become experts in how complex, how difficult, and how costly it is to produce housing. But I think we still scratch our heads. Why is it so costly? Why is it so complex? What we're going to do today is we're going to try to unpack everything. We're going to show you the elements and the segments and the pieces that make it challenging. And then we're going to take each of those pieces and try to analyze it. And our experts are going to try to explore levers and tools we can use by understanding these pieces to try to start solving the larger holistic problem of housing production. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Drew Hudasik. Great. Thank you, Eric. And uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council, staff, and, and the city of San Jose for having us back. Uh, we've done this a bit before, and uh, we expect a lot of Q&A um, after our presentation here, and happy to answer your questions. So, you know, what are we going to cover today? One um, thing we want to acknowledge up front, you know, the four of us on this panel at some level are part of the development industry or our developers ourselves, um, but we're, we're part of a much bigger process. Development of any kind involves uh, the city or jurisdiction that's approving a development, it involves the community, um, it involves market forces that you know, push and pull on the need for housing, where to put it, the financial aspects behind it. And um, you know, we are just one piece of that process. 
Um, and as we present information today, you know, one of the things we want to give you are, are the tools, hopefully, to make decisions a few weeks from now, months, years, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to present the information. At one level, it, anything in the development world can be a number on a spreadsheet. And at the under end of the spectrum, you know, we know that these things have real effects on people's lives and the shelter over their head. Um, and there's a, there's a middle ground. So if, if some of the information seems a little bit calloused in the way that it's converted to numbers, um, that's just one way to look at it that ultimately needs to be converted into public policy. And that's way above our pay grade, which is why we're, uh, we're sitting here in the box, as Rosalyn um, mentioned to us. So we're going to cover how developers and investors look at risk and return uh, at a broad brush level, um, get into the costs and valuations of multifamily housing, and then uh, what I'll call chapter three, really discussing what are some of the levers that you may or may not be able to pull depending on policy decisions. So risk and return. You know, there are many, many types of, of real estate today. Obviously, we're focused on housing. We're going to address a little bit of affordable. Uh, mostly, we are talking not about for sale housing, but more often uh, multifamily rental housing. It's a, a type of real estate that produces an income stream. And ultimately, that's the way you know, the investors in the financial markets are going to look at it. And I touched on this a little bit before, but there seems to be a public perception that developers get to write the rules. And that is the furthest thing from the truth, right? We, we understand there are market forces that are so much stronger than we are. Uh, and I, you know, I try to lighten this up a little bit, put a picture of the new Coke. You know, a lot of people did a lot of research and thought that new Coke was going to be a fantastic idea. And then the market spoke. Uh, I think most of us in the room remember, remember that, and, and probably most people at home watching remember that. But it's just an illustration that, you know, we can think a building is the greatest idea in the world or the worst, and we're not always right. The market speaks. So when we talk about risk and return, you know, we as developers really, uh, we have our views, but, but the financial markets and our investors speak very loudly. And of course, every investor, as we see in that cloud up at the top, tries to get the biggest return they can with the smallest amount of risk. Uh, but the markets are competitive, of course. So the investors that typically put money in our projects, and they can include you know, large pension funds, endowments, um, big banks and investment banks, uh, CalSTRS and CalPERS, as a matter of fact, are some of the largest investors in California real estate. Investors often talk about real estate in these four buckets, core, core plus, et cetera. But really, the first three on the lower risk end are all referring to existing buildings and things that you may or may not need to do to improve them. The opportunity piece is really where development falls. And that, illustrated by this, this diagram, is on the most risky end of the spectrum. And then when you talk about the types of what we call the food groups in real estate, apartments do tend to be on the lower risk end of the spectrum. And the theory being that when you have housing that you're asking rent for, at some level, and of course, in California, we think about the high cost of housing and not having enough. It is the fact there are markets across the country where you know, the rents move up and down, depending on how much that housing is needed. But as an owner of apartments, you can always lower the price and find somebody who needs to live there. As an owner of things like office buildings, hotel rooms, et cetera, on the riskier end of the spectrum, when the market doesn't need it, it doesn't need it at any price. So you know, when I talk about the community that developers are dealing with, this is one illustration. You could easily turn this diagram on its head and put the city at the center and have all of your stakeholders around um, including the development community as one of the spokes or, or um, one of the nodes. But this is just to show there are so many different voices that are speaking um, to bring a development project together, and we have to listen to all of them. You know, we, we like to use the uh, analogy of movie production. And um, in the movie business, and, and yeah, we threw in a hometown slide. We're not, we're not above that. The... Um, the, the movie producer brings the team together, right? And th they have some expertise, but they are hiring the screenwriters, the directors, they're bringing the money together. That is exactly what a developer is doing. We may have anywhere from 20 to 100 consultants or uh, parties that we're dealing with on any one development project. And the more, 
the riskier, obviously. So now I'm going to hand it over to Libby in a moment, and we're going to talk a bit about um, the costs that are associated with producing that housing. And there's a couple different ways we're going to look at it. The first one here is what makes up all of the money that builds a building? And so the three simplified um, buckets here are the debt, the investor equity, and the developer equity. And typically, developers are going out and bringing in other equity investors. And in theory, the equity is at risk. And if the project goes bad, equity can be lost. If the project goes well, uh, the equity investors and the developer profit. Uh, but that is not as always the case. Uh, this little diagram here, and this, this is a hometown nod for myself. I grew up uh, a Giants fan, I hate to say, but my coworker threw this one in. When things go really well, you build something illustrated by the cost on the left, and it's worth its value, which is hopefully larger, more on the right. Uh, the bank gets paid back the same amount of debt, but again, the investor and the developer um, benefit. When things don't go well, illustrated by this left and right, cost on the left, value on the right. It's the equity that loses. The developer and the investor lose together. The bank still gets their money back. Then you have times like the great financial crisis. And this is when value drops so precipitously, or somebody has made a new Coke type of decision, where the project is worth not just so little that all the equity is wiped out, but that the debt is impacted. This happened during the great financial crisis in 08, 09, and 10. Uh, and one of the tough messages these days, and, and a few of us have been at some conferences over the last couple of weeks, all the talk of inflation, all the talk of economic uncertainty is absolutely hitting the real estate markets, and it is causing more uncertainty. There's nothing that investors hate more than uncertainty. And so we're at a moment in time where there may be some policy levers that you could pull and still not have an effect. But one of the messages we want to get across today is that we're going to be talking about policy decisions that you make for the long term, and hopefully it tees up the city so that when conditions are, uh, are ripe, then the, the right kind of development will come into play. So I'm going to pass it to Libby here in a moment. This is a different way of looking at the cost, not just the money that makes it up, but what are the, the layers of cost in those same projects? And it's no mistake that we've highlighted the box that says fees and extractions, and, or exactions, excuse me. The, um, the fees and exactions can be anything and everything from, you know, park fees, development fees, um, and, and all sorts of, of benefits that come with cost. And we certainly have to acknowledge, you know, everything that a development project can entail has both a cost and a benefit. And that policy decision, again, falls into your lap. So building on what Drew just said, so every fee or exaction, for example, requiring an off-site infrastructure improvement to serve affordable housing or market rate housing has a cost associated with it. That cost has to get baked into the pro forma, the development budget, um, and it adds to the total costs. And if the market is good, as Drew just said, development can move forward with new projects and it can pay for a lot of these costs. It can fully cover park fees and amenities and community benefits and all of the things that we really value and think are so important. But if project costs go up to a certain point and rent and values don't, projects die. Um, and it really is often like the straw that breaks the camel's back. Even though one, one of those things individually isn't the issue, it's all of them added together. And the last bullet is really important, is that when the market is good, it's fabulous. But they're typically short in duration, whereas you've got to be thinking for the long term, particularly if you're doing multifamily housing in California, just the entitlement process, the construction process, the lease up process, that is five years minimum often. Um, and so you're looking, you've got to make it through usually more than one cycle. And it's very important not to miss that window. So we want to talk about um, conceptually something that um, the two sort of the bookends of this building on what we said earlier. So at the top, at the green, 
when everything is working well, you have a developer margin or return, also called profit. But the reason why this is also called margin and return is it has to deal with those contingencies. It has to deal with the fact that, um, that both investors need to get their returns, but that things don't always happen the way you think they're going to happen, hence the term margin. If there is not sufficient return for the investor community to have any interest, they won't play. They won't give the developer any money. If the developer doesn't think that there's enough in it for the developer, if they can't pay their cost of staff, if they can't recoup their investment, then they're not going to play. So that green bar has to be sufficient enough to attract the investor capital as well as developer interest. At the bottom side, um, the blue bar is the land cost, the residual land value. The land cost is not always a fixed amount, but it is a fixed amount in the case where a developer is agreeing with a, with a seller as to what they're going to pay for the property. At that point, it becomes a fixed, a fixed cost. There are two ways in which those costs occur in development. One is that that cost is just an agreed upon price. I'm going to agree to pay you $6 million for your piece of property. Another way is that a developer may enter into an agreement with a landowner which says you have, in essence, a participation with me. I'm going to guarantee to pay you a certain amount, but if I get these entitlements, I may pay you more. So there's that kind of a deal. And sometimes developers have to put out the entire amount of money up front. Sometimes they option the property. But at some point, their money goes hard. So at some point, a developer has millions of dollars of investment in a property in terms of land, as well as, as sometimes millions of dollars in entitlement costs. Uh, planning costs to pursue the development. At the same time, when a developer is evaluating a deal, or if the investment community is evaluating a deal, or they're comparing deals across markets, they do what's called a residual land value analysis. And you're going to hear about that more from staff today because that's the analysis that's been performed in San Jose. And they're going to do this, this calculation where they're going to be looking at, actually I'm going to skip one slide and then I'm going to go back, uh, and then I'll go back to the concept of the other slide, where they're going to be saying the difference between the potential value that you can get, so the potential value of that apartment building, once it's fully built, once there's, it's occupied and producing income, and the projected development cost without land, including whatever the target return on investment is, that developer margin, that developer return or profit, that when you take that value and you take the costs away, you get your residual land value. That residual land value has to be higher than what you are going to have to pay for it, as a developer, are going to have to pay for the land cost. And it's going to have to be high enough that you can deal with some of the contingency of things that are going to happen or could happen for you. And the sky, and I, and so just going back one slide, which is not, uh, there we go. So the value of land is tied to the rights that you, as a public agency, confer to it, right, as part of the entitlement process, the rights are associated with the land, I get to build 100 units of housing on it, um, as well as the liabilities that are associated with the land. For example, if it's got toxic cleanup associated with it, that cost has to be factored in. Um, it's also a market-driven situation where landowners may think that they have something that's a lot more valuable than what it may pencil out on on a residual land value basis. So what we're going to look at is a theoretical project in San Jose, a multifamily apartment development with 10% to 15% on-site affordable, and a developer who might be comparing your inclusionary housing requirements and your costs and your revenues to a property in another jurisdiction nearby. It's an existing retail property um, with existing retail on it, and we've got a negotiated purchase price of $6 million, though of course the owner would prefer more, and you might have to pay more depending on how long the process takes because sometimes um, owners require that if you don't close in the land within a certain amount of time, you have to pay more for it. The proposed building characteristics are seven stories with a two-story podium. And the investment community and the developer are going to run some sensitivity analysis on this investment, and they're going to look at four initial scenarios. They're going to look at 
What if I have 10% on-site below market rate units? What if um, right now I've got a sense of what I think the off-site costs and the fees are, but what if those increase by $20,000 per unit, which can happen during the development process? What if construction costs increase by 10%? We're definitely in a construction cost increase climate right now. It's been increasing about 6% per year recently. And what about if we have an alternative affordable requirement? And so run scenarios and you say, okay, we're trying to hit $6 million. We're running four independent scenarios. So my base case, oh, I've got lots of room. I've got, I'm getting residual land value of $16 million. But if my fees go up by 20,000 a unit, that residual land value drops. Construction drops, the construct, if, sorry, if construction prices increase, my residual land value drops. And if I have 15% on-site BMR, my residual land value is less than if I had 10% BMR. Um, and it depends on the income targeting, which we'll talk about a little later in the presentation about how much it affects it. But what if we also look at a fifth scenario, which is that we're allowed to have parking reduction, which is something you as a policy group have actually allowed, is parking reductions for housing. And in particular for ground floor retail, it can be very important to allow parking reductions for that, particularly if it's structured parking. Because if you're looking at the parking cost per space, it is much less expensive to do surface parking. So this existing retail has surface parking much more cost effective, but as soon as you go into a podium underneath housing, and this is a seven-story building, it's more expensive. If it also goes partially below grade, it's even more expensive, and if heaven forbid you've got to go down two levels below grade, it gets very expensive per parking space. So every cost of parking can actually make a difference in how many units you can produce. So. We run this analysis and we say, okay, independently, each of these works okay, but if we run all four of the first scenarios, to, well, actually, the off-site fees, the construction cost increase, and the 15% on-site BMR, if we put all of those together, then we don't generate enough residual land value. In fact, it's less than a million dollars. And if we were to do it, though, in combination with a parking reduction, then it starts to work again. What's really important, I think, oh. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, on the way down here, we're actually thinking about, uh, you know, another way to think about this, um, this slide before is almost if you envision the scales of justice, right? And the goal is that the city is putting weight on one side that is costing the project, but you're getting benefit, and the community is getting benefit out of that. In a perfect world, the city gets all of the benefit they would want. All of the little weights go on one side and it still stays in balance and projects can go forward. The, the difficulty that we all face a, a, as a group trying to get the, the goals that we all want is that the financial markets and the uh, you know, developer sentiment moves much, much faster than public policy can move. And so the best thing that you can do as a council is set up the policies in a way that provides some consistency, provides some predictability, and at certain times, you're going to get a lot of development, and other times, you're not. Um, and you may be able to pull some levers quickly, but m many of them take a long time to pull. It's setting the stage for what you want that's most critical. And I want to add one other thing. What happens when the residual land value drops too low? That means the land is not used for housing. They'll keep it as a parking lot, a car wash, uh, whatever other purpose that has a higher value than $1 million. And that's also... If you start losing opportunity sites for housing, then there's less housing production. Just to be clear, in this example, the threshold would be six million. Is that right? The threshold was six million. Okay, so if there's Correct. anything less than six million, it stays a car wash. It stays a car wash. Okay. Thank you. So, so basically, to summarize this is, if you run these sensitivity cases individually, right, you still have a deal, but if you combine them, then you don't have a deal. But if you pull another policy lever, like reducing parking, then you get a deal again, right? So what we wanted to do with this illustration was just illustrate to you the importance of your policy decisions to helping tip the scale, as, as Drew was just saying. And that it really does make a difference. And it may seem like it doesn't, but it really does. And to build on what I said earlier, that um, 
the more straws that we can take off the camel's back, right, the more likely the camel will move forward. Um, so what we're going to do, oh, is there any more you wanted to add to this? No. Okay, so what we're going to do now is go into chapter three about what can policy do. So what are these policy levers that we're all going to talk about? And there's three policy levers that we're going to speak about. Sure. So, you know, in the equation of an income producing piece of real estate, the two ways to make things better are increase the revenue or decrease the cost. Um, you know, and, and it's easier said than done, of course. And then the third, we're going to talk about increasing certainty. And mo most often that's certainty of process, um, but certainly certainty of policy over a longer time, um, you know, makes uh, development happen more often. We used to say uh, in, our, in our office that a perfect city to us is a city where you could walk into City Hall with a proposal or with an idea and a staff planner that you speak to, the community development director, the mayor, and a planning commissioner would all give you the same answer as to what they would like to see on a particular piece of land. That's almost never the case, but that would be perfection. Um, the bottom message, though, is don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, right? We are in a housing crisis, as Mayor Licardo said. So many cities that we are dealing with they say out loud they're in a crisis, but they are not reacting as if they're in a crisis. They're not making policy decisions to respond to a crisis. And that's really what we need to do in California. So you touched on this one earlier. Right, so we just wanna thank you very much for making your parking requirements more flexible and lowering them. Um, we understand that you've alleviated them on affordable housing. We'd like you to consider you know, being flexible in your parking requirements, particularly as it relates to ground floor retail and in transit-friendly places for multifamily housing. So, so for many, many years, we wanted to create active streets. And we thought the way to create active streets was to enforce and require retail. I think we've learned now that empty retail does not produce active streets. <laughs> Occupied housing does produce active streets. So this is another, um, another thing you can do to change that policy to what's currently needed. This is probably one nobody wants to jump on, but you know, park fees, park requirements, again, if you boil it down to a cost, um, it can be looked at that way. It is certainly one of the greatest public benefits that comes with new development projects. Um, and we have seen cities uh, change policies, sometimes just in the short term, uh, to spur development when that was their desired result. Processing fees are not a big part of the equation. However, they are when developers have the most expensive money. The most expensive money is most probably land, but the second most expensive money is pre-development and processing money because that money has to come out of developer equity, out of their investment, or out of their investor equity because you don't get construction financing when you're trying to process a development. You have to wait. Construction financing comes in last. So it is important, even though it may be a small cost, to think about it in terms of the timing and the impact on investment. Um, I think for the same reasons that Libby stated, lower utility connection fees, pay a lot of different fees, and also inspection fees, et cetera. And I, I think the next one I'd like to also touch upon, because we've been thinking about it a lot, there's two things for affordability. There's the number of units that are affordable and the average median income of those affordable units. So there may be a way where you balance the two. You can play with those two. You can have more on-site affordable but increase the affordability to be more workforce, middle income. Or if you want to target more of the lower income, then lower the number of units. It's, again, as Drew said, we don't want to be callous about a very sensitive subject such as affordable housing, but it is ultimately a a number on a spreadsheet that you have these two levers to work with. And, and I just wanted to add on the utility piece, um, not just utility connection fees, but also the infrastructure investment. Um, I hear about this a lot, which is both for affordable housing as well as market rate housing, whereas, and I understand as a city, you need that infrastructure. So you need the water and the sewer 
delivered properly. But what can happen is there can be these surprise investments, like the Public Works Department didn't necessarily let the developer know. There isn't necessarily a path forward where a group of property owners together may make this investment. So the first in to do that new, new residential development has to pick up the entire burden. There may or may not be a reimbursement clause for that, for that developer to get reimbursed. And that can make a significant difference to a deal. It can tank deals, not just for market rate, but affordable as well. So real estate tax abatement might be one that we would need a magic wand to uh, you know, to implement, but it's just up here to point out that in a typical uh, multifamily apartment project, 50% of the operating expenses are real estate taxes. And so one of the things, um, and Nevada is certainly a, a much better expert at this than, than we are uh, being in the affordable space, but limiting or eliminating real estate taxes is a huge cost on a project. And back in the days when we had redevelopment agencies and TIF financing, you know, cities or agencies could return some of that money to either a project itself or the area of town that it wanted. It's a little bit more difficult these days, but um, there are some creative ways to do it and certainly, um, you know, larger state policy that may allow that to happen again in the future. Associated with lowering, so lowering construction costs, that's just as, pretty much as hard as trying to abate real estate tax. Uh, everyone keeps thinking about, you know, alternative, um, modular, offsite. It's, uh, we, we could spend a whole day talking about that, but a couple of thoughts. Along with real estate tax abatement, maybe something more within reach is sales tax abatement. Uh, developers were charged by the construction uh, industry fair amount of sales tax on all the um, all the materials and services. So maybe we can abate the sales tax on new housing construction. And um, I guess a more radical idea is maybe the city can help lend its negotiation powers to each housing developer on an individual basis to try to negotiate maybe materials or services on a bulk, almost like a healthcare system for housing. And again, none of these are easy, but um, considering the cost of sustainability and reach goals, you know, we have seen some cities institute uh, policies that are very, very well intentioned with respect to the environment and sustainability. But, uh, you know, one, one example is a city that wants all electric, um, you know, buildings in the future as well as electric vehicle charging. And by the way, PG&E said, oh, if every house was electric and everybody had an electric vehicle, we don't have a grid that could support all of that. And so it's those types of coordinations and, and maybe putting policies in over time, um, or again, considering the, the cost benefit analysis when you're in a crisis as to which is, which is more critical, having any housing at all or um, you know, having all the sustainability goals reached. And can I just add on the PG&E note that Coordination with PG&E is incredibly important. So having a staff person that is actually working actively with PG&E to help facilitate some of these because some of the requirements are also a barrier to housing as well. So on the revenue side, um, Eric touched on this a little bit before, just those levers within the affordability world of both pr uh, income, range, target, as well as number of units are two different levers to pull. So I think that this one is really important, and I know that um, Jackie and her team and you as city council members do everything in your power to try to secure more funding for housing. Um, this is incredibly important. Um, the rental housing voucher programs that the Santa Clara County Housing Authority is administering are particularly important to those who are very um, extre extremely low income levels and need rental subsidy. Um, but we're always looking for opportunities to try to figure out how to leverage those dollars and to be able to include them in, in market rate mixed income affordable housing. As Libby pointed out earlier, developers will only, or investors will invest when they know there's a target return. The higher the transfer, ta transfer tax, because these investors are looking to invest and exit in five years, the higher the transfer tax, the, more, the higher the hurdle to hit that target return. So maybe reducing or relaxing transfer taxes on housing projects. And don't worry, we're really getting to the fun ones now. Um, limiting the effect of rent control. So I know this has been a, um, a big topic in San Jose. 
Um, there's, you know, no shortage of economists who, um, who argue, you know, on both sides of the rent control debate. Uh, all I can say with certainty is that from the standpoint of investment dollars, um, it can be perceived as a risk. Um, and it's just worth knowing that as you make those policy decisions. Th this one is near and dear to my heart, um, streamlining the approval process. And as Libby mentioned earlier, the riskiest dollars that are spent in development are upfront when nobody has any idea what the finish line is gonna look like. And there are examples, um, we'll get to Redwood City in a moment, you know, it, it was a downtown that blossomed in the last 15, 10 years, but what allowed it to blossom was a foundation in their planning and policy that was set 20 years prior to this, the downtown really blossoming. Um, and so when we talk about certainty and processing, it can be um, the city front running CEQA, it can be the city front running what types of uses you would like to see, so that again, in that perfect world where a proposal comes into city hall and everybody you know, from the mayor on down knows exactly what the answer is to say, this is what we want on that site, this is what we're willing to support, and this is why. This one is, um, I know, a, a tricky one as well, and it's only gonna work in certain locations, possibly converting office to housing. I think as important alongside of it is like the retail or shopping center to housing conversion, and also one that's not up there, which is church property to housing, or a part of church property to housing. Looking at um, alternative uses, as Eric was just saying, that aren't housing now, how can we convert them to housing? It's often, um, it's complex for staff, it's complex for you as decision makers, it's often complex for the neighbors because they're used to the existing use being something different, so it takes a lot of education. But we think it's really important to think about these alternative locations for housing. And, you, and you've pioneered looking at it, you know, being able to put affordable housing in industrial areas, for example. You know, chime in real quick. I think a lot of people thought, you know, with the downtowns being empty and offices being empty, the silver bullet would be converting underutilized Class B and C uh, office buildings into housing. Everyone's looking at it. It's much harder than it looks. We are working with other groups, ULI is, to try to figure out different archetypes that actually fit. Unfortunately, there needs to be some pain and blood on the streets with office buildings dropping to below 300 bucks a foot before that can become a reality. But that's something to be exploring, and we will need the city's help to relax requirements in order to make that happen. So, uh, and I touched on Redwood City already, so we'll jump past this one. Uh, this will conclude our piece of the um, presentation, so we'll uh, throw in one last hometown image as we get to our end and pass it on to Nevada, and then obviously we'll be here for questions um, after staff uh, gives their report. Way to Thank play you. with the home crowd, Drew. Nice job. <laughs> There we go. Good afternoon, I'm Nevada Merriman. I'm the policy director for Midpen Housing. You are familiar with our organization. Uh, in addition to the 2,500 residents of San Jose that we are proud to say are Midpenners, Midpen residents, we have another 311 homes in the pipeline. Um, the picture to the right there is the Emanuel Sobrato uh, permanent supportive housing community that is one of the case studies in, in the uh, study session material that you have before you today. Um, I want to offer my thanks to the city's staff and the consultant teams who have been approaching this topic with great rigor and we have been um, really trying to as well at, at, at MidPen um, uh, sharpen our understanding of the issue so that we can look at our solutions. We work in 11 counties so there's many opportunities for contrast on a city by city level. And I'm gonna jump right into it so that we can have plenty of time for questions. Um, in the Silicon Valley, uh, the more that you are looking to reduce rents and subsidize at the, lower, at the lower affordability levels, the further we are away from the market. So we have the three bars here, an extremely low income family, 
uh, is you could see much further away from the red line of income needed to get up to where you can go out on the street and purchase, uh, rent your apartment. Um, at the very low income uh, level, it's about in the middle, and at the low income level, you're seeing it's getting pretty close. So that might mean that um, some older apartment stock, um, the 20, 20, 30 year old apartments, um, you would might be able to be, uh, uh, that's probably where you're seeing a lot of those groups that are not in deed restricted affordable housing, where, how they're finding housing. Um, this is made worse by income inequality. Year over year, you're seeing 10% jumps in um, what the area median income is, uh, and wages aren't keeping up with that. I don't, very few professions are getting 10% year over year increase uh, uh, when it comes time for their performance review. So people are, if, if you're feeling as though you know, many families are not keeping up, it's because they aren't. They aren't keeping up with the, the progression and the rate that this is happening at. The market doesn't produce it because it simply doesn't pencil. You, um, it, it very simply said, the, uh, if, if, uh, if I want to go and purchase a single family home, um, the bank is going to look at my revenue, my pay stubs. And the, the analogous piece to that in multifamily development is they're going to look at the income that your residents are putting together. Uh, if, if your residents are unable to afford uh, up to that red line, which we just saw, if they're not, if they're not making that six-figure salary, um, you have a lot less income to work with, and therefore your, your mortgage is much smaller. Um, we, that difference between what our residents can afford, the, the mortgage that we can afford to support through their income, and uh, what we really need in order to, to build the housing, because uh, as your uh, reports suggest, Affordable housing is not, uh, in some cases, is a little bit more expensive sometimes than market rate. Uh, we don't get a haircut on the cost to build the, build the new units. Um, that's what's known as the gap, uh, and it's where many different public sources come in to try to fill that gap. We primarily, the federal government has the primary tool for encouraging affordable development is through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and there's two programs that drive slightly different results, uh, but the overall kind of rhythm of the programs is the same, uh, where we are looking at the amount and trying to maximize that amount of federal equity that we can bring in to our localities, and then um, using local dollars. In that, usually in that beginning part um, that Ms. Seifel so nicely spoke about, where, uh, where, where maybe a mid-pen has an advantage over a Saris Regis is that at times uh, if a city's able to free up some of those early dollars for pre-development, that risky money there. We're using that and then trying to build something that later on we can go together, go leverage uh, outside federal dollars. And then private investment from, from the uh, equity community. So that's the capital stack, the simple version, um, <laughs> which people just love to see. Uh, and with a 9% credit, um, you're getting about 60-ish percent, that top purple uh, from the federal government. With a 4% credit, you're getting 30, maybe 40 percent-ish. Um, uh, so uh, the, in a 9% in program, you're usually um, also required to do deeper affordability. Uh, and because the federal sources are able to cover more, in some cases you may be able to have fewer local sources. And local here would usually mean between, between the city, um, potentially some um, version of free land or reduced subsidized land. We have a, our, our Emanuel Sobrato project again is on a church site and you'll see it has the lowest land cost per unit uh, of the example studied, so maybe between either land or city, uh, there's certainly measure A dollars from the county uh, and also your housing authority. Those are the types of sources that we're looking to layer in to figure out this gap. The not so simple version <laughs> is that over the years, um, it's become increasingly, you know, instead of having uh, eight, one gap source or two gap sources, sometimes it's four or five. Um, when at times we, we must go to the state together to find an additional program um, to further subsidize. Those in turn are usually driven by um, single policy objectives of the state. So there is a, 
For instance, there's an infill infrastructure program, and so that is going to benefit um, anything that's built kind of within the urban core of most cities. Uh, there's a multifamily housing program, and that particular program benefits is looking for deep affordability. So at, at each stage where we're needing to go and find another source, there's probably some other um, obligation, shall we say, the, some very specific obligation, whether it's carbon reduction, deep affordability, an infill site, transit-oriented development, a program for veterans. I could go on, but every single one of these layers, although the, it may add, uh, it may take down the gap, it's probably not a one-for-one -one gap takedown there because it's probably adding something at the same time. To get to the timeline on the project here, you know, um, I've been with Nipen for 15 years, and the first 13 years of that, I was in our real estate development team. So uh, it was um, living and breathing the entitlement process of Silicon Valley, mostly San Mateo, Santa Clara County. Uh, and that timeline in between there, um, developing the project concept and then trying to really uh, move that into entitlements. That used to be the area where we were the most stuck and it was the most difficult to really assess risk. Um, and that, that was a, a period of time uh, you know, where, we could, where entitlements could stretch for years sometimes, especially if you were looking to, um, if you needed a general plan amendment and really needed to change the zoning. Um, now I would say the flavor of affordable housing that's really taken off and changed since 2020 is that um, the, the green box here, the funding assembly, um, that's really, not to take anything away from the art of entitling projects, but it's really the funding assembly where it has um, the, the bottleneck of, of this year, or uh, the 2020 and beyond era is, um, is blooming. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to the city staff, but also to uh, you, Mayor, for your advocacy at the state level um, last year. Uh, at a critical time, at a critical hearing, uh, there was an um, uh, effective uh, media strategy so as to call attention to the fact that not a single 4% tax credit project that was competing for bonds from any of the big three cities of Northern California, San Francisco, Oakland, or San Jose, was in competitive range for funding. You know, so that um, brought about kind of a bigger picture policy question you know, what's wrong with the scoring if these big cities can't get something through? Um, and so that's a con because bonds are competitive now, and before 2020 they were not. So when you got, you got your project together, you went and got your bonds. Now you get your project together, and you have to go compete. And I wish, it could, I, wish I could say it was, uh, it was easy for us, but in many cases we're competing against our peers. So Midpen is competing against Eden. The city, in some cases, could be competing against their own projects. So that funding assembly, continued need for state advocacy uh, and the resources to, to build out what you are experiencing in a different part of your city, which is planning for your regional housing needs uh, allocation, where the numbers at this point for um, very low, low, and, um, well, they don't, they don't check extremely low, but I, I try to, I try to, uh, to um, follow that. So you're at the lower levels of affordability, you're having you know, very large numbers in which you're being asked to own for, and the, the resources at the state level and the federal level are not quite at that level to support that. So that's where we're seeing right now the uncertainty. Um, so all, that just means that all of the good work that your uh, staff has continued to do and, and the embrace, the city's posture of embracing many of these state financing tools uh, the streamlining tools um, is is helpful to us. Um, I'm going to just bring up a quick example from a, a city just a little bit north of you in San Mateo. City owned property to adjacent sites in their downtown. Um, and the elegance of this example is that with two policy changes, they were able to drop seventy five thousand dollars a door. So, uh, AB 1763 was a unlimited density bonus for um, sites that were near pretty good transit. Um, in this case, you, or in any case, you can add up to three stories. Uh, and the city of San Mateo said, oh, I know you're halfway through entitlements, but can you go back and look at this and see what you can do? So they wanted to maximize what is a precious resource for them, which is their land. They don't have that many publicly owned pieces of land 
to try to um, make a difference. Uh, and so they, they really compelled us to go and take a look at it. And we said, well, I, it would make sense for us to add two stories and 60-ish units. Um, do we need to add the parking with that? Uh, they waived the parking on those new units. And so with adding the two stories and not requiring the parking there, uh, we are actually right across the street from a city-owned garage. So there's a little bit of a, there's, some, there's other parking that's, uh, that is around. Um, they were able, we were able to lower the price per unit by almost $75,000 a door. So big moves can be made in this arena with a couple, with a couple great decisions. And that's a theme um, throughout. So this is, this is sort of a, these black boxes here, new state tools, streamlined financing, fees, and, and at, at the bottom here, public sector flexibility. These are the different kind of um, dots, if you will, that we are uh, in the cities where we are frequent flyers. We're really asking our city partners to come together and help us connect those dots and strengthen the connective tissue because uh, there's not a single one of these um, projects that we're working on where we can say it's just one of these boxes that is making it feasible. It's putting them all together. That's the art. And um, having, uh, in addition to your, to your uh, development partners, you have many best-in-class ones that operate here in the city, also having uh, really talented staff that can help us see uh, which, what, some of the dots that are possible to be connected here and really help us be creative about what we can go uh, and try to put together. So. Um, we discussed the addition of 61 units that drives efficiency, uh, streamlined financing, um, and the continued pressure on the state uh, public policy advocacy at the state level is uh, needed so that we have enough resources that the city can, and it's obvious that the city can compete for the resources uh, at a level that is at least, you know, not giving a, the Northern California city somehow a disadvantage. Um, Fees is always relevant, uh, enduring relevance of either deferring fees uh, till later on in the process or waiving them all together. I will mention that Sunnyvale for a decade has had um, a policy of uh, not requiring park fees for 100% affordable housing. Um, and that often takes down the cost by five or 6% of the total development cost, which is huge. Um, but Impact fee deferrals are also very useful. So when we go out and start our construction, uh, typically at this point we are needing to use a construction loan. The interest on that, you've uh, heard that um, interest has gone up. So it's, it's more expensive money than we used to have. And we are, we are buying down, taking down those fees usually when we are um, obtaining our building permit. So we, we're, we're taking down those fees then, and that's two years of a construction loan where, it's cre where there's interest every month that we're paying on those fees. So if we can defer that by two years and instead um, make it a condition of us obtaining occupancy or our, uh, our CFO, um, it, it's, a, it's a substantial amount, usually hundreds of thousands of dollars on these um, projects. So uh, it's uh, worth considering, um, and we would appreciate the consideration there. Um, and then. Uh, on the public sector flexibility, we, we could continue to, and I, I'm curious to hear where you may have questions on this, but our, the internal champions and the um, in, innovations that the public sector is coming to us with, um, this is just really critical to the secret sauce of making stuff happen right now. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panel. Uh, Mayor, this completes this segment of the presentation and we can pause here for questions from the council discussion. And by segment, you mean uh, we're gonna go to a staff presentation after this? That's correct. Okay, um, I'm just thinking out loud about a uh, sequence here. Okay, why don't we go to uh, the council for questions. And while folks are thinking of their questions, look going online here to see who's I'll, I'll throw out mine um, since folks are not leaping to their virtual feet yet. Um, I, Eric, I appreciate your, first of all, thank you all for the presentation, really appreciate it. And thank you for your longstanding relationship. And in Drew's case, your uh, services and your investment in our city and, and all that, that you guys are doing to try to help cities figure this out. Um, Eric, you mentioned the, the conversion of class B and C buildings. I know that the office conversions are on everyone's mind, I know. 
and to sure. ourselves as well and work on something now with Councilmember Pross and try to figure out how can we do this in downtown. As I recall, Gensler did a study, I think, in Calgary, um, kind of concluded, hey, those older 50s and 60s office buildings with the smaller floor plates tend to be more ideal because uh, sunlight is, is at a premium, um, particularly with larger floor plates. Uh, I, I appreciate there are really large capital costs involved here around plumbing and utilities uh, to make those retrofits. But as we're thinking about trying to ready ourselves for a potential, what we hope might be some builders or investors that would be interested in doing this, because I think we all see we're going to we're going to have lots of vacant office for a while, for perhaps a very long time. I think it's 25 million square feet now are vacant in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's creeping down here. And frankly, I'd love to get some of this older office off the inventory. So that way we can focus everybody on the high end office that is being built now and, and get that filled up. So I guess the big question is, you said it's going to take office cost getting down to about $300 a square foot. We're a ways away from that today. I'm guessing it won't take long for high interest rates <laughs> and a lot of vacancy to push some of those prices down. <laughs> I'd like to be ready when that happens so we can suddenly get some housing converted and we could, you know, fill our downtown with, you know, 4,000 more people. And, you know, <laughs> nothing would be better for helping out a small restaurant or, you know, and anybody else is struggling here downtown. What are the non-obvious things we should be looking at as a city to sort of facilitate that? And I, I put it to Eric because he mentioned it, but anybody wants to jump in. And, and are, there, are there experts out there we should be talking to? Because I know it's happening outside the barrier. We're seeing it in cities like Kansas City. I was just talking to the mayor, of, I think Cincinnati, he said they were doing it like crazy out there. Clearly other cities are doing it with lower construction costs. How could we get there? Um. Glad you asked. ULI is on it. Good. We're on it right now. Uh, we're working with Gensler. I was just talking to Raymond from Toronto. They're, uh, they've devised this app. They call it an app. It's a prototyping app to you, you put different office prototypes in and it outspits whether or not this is appropriate for conversion or not. What are the costs? Um, I guess a couple of observations. I think being on the West Coast with our land was a blessing and a curse. The blessing was we had all this land, so we created different financial districts, residential districts, unlike the East Coast, which didn't have the benefit. But now we're seeing the curse part of it. We don't have housing next to financial districts and have the integration, but we realize we want that because it's, it's, we want a work, live, play city. Um, what can a city be doing? So part of this study, and we hope to have it by Q1 next year, and maybe we come back, Rosalind, and talk about our findings with Gensler and Spur. We're working with Spur and Gensler together. It's going to be, we're going to require city partnerships, whether it's relaxation on, you know, um, accessibility, relaxation on seismic, relaxation on other types of requirements and fees and affordability. All of the, many of the items that were uh, teased out here as things that suppress development, maybe for downtown office to resident conversions, those elements can be part of the part of what the city can do to ensure that it happens so we can get it over the hump. Um, using a lot of camo analogies these days, but that's a different type of hump. Uh, We've so, had a drought for a long it, time. So. Yes, yeah. yes, another one, good one. Um, so that's, that's something we can definitely share with uh, the city and uh, so we can layer maybe a la carte menu what the city can do to get it to make it financial feasibility. And this report will be on the ULI website and we'll be able to look at it. Yep. That's great. You know, and some of the things I would add, we touched on in the presentation, um, the fee structure associated with a conversion could be addressed ahead of time. Um, you know, parking is certainly uh, one that no, nobody likes to hear it, but oftentimes when developers are looking at a piece of land, uh, they start with the parking count and then figure out how many cars can I park, therefore how much can I build on top of that parking. And if you have an existing office building, one of the advantages you'll have is that although there's a height limit because of the airport flight path, if you're taking over a superstructure that exists, um, if it has the right <clears throat> characteristics of seismic, et cetera, um, you, you couldn't even begin to rebuild that superstructure for $300 a square foot. Right. If that's what those buildings are gonna trade for, and, and I think they may, and they will. 
Um, so there, there could definitely be some opportunity there. It's really studying what is your building stock, um, how are you going to address the things like parking that's maybe the low-hanging fruit, um, things like school fees you maybe can't address because you don't directly control that, right? But so the things that you directly control um, are the areas I'd focus on. And, and we just got back from Dallas where the Eoli Fall meeting was, yeah. and there's some really interesting examples in downtown yeah. Dallas. Um, and one I'll just point out on the parking theme is the National Hotel. Um, it was done by Todd Development. It's really interesting, but it didn't have much parking because historically in downtown Dallas there were tons of surface parking lots, so the office buildings themselves didn't have much parking. So the city of Dallas is allowing valet parking and a very, very small amount of parking within the actual building. Um, for the residents there. They're, they're actually finding, and this is a good and a bad, so I'll just point it out, that a number of the residents of this particular building are not full-time residents, so they don't necessarily need full-time parking. Right. Um, so it is something to really be thinking about, the, the parking situation, whether or not you can allow shared parking in some of the public parking garages through some kind of program or with other buildings um, and not require a large amount of parking, particularly in an older building where it just may not be provided or was provided at a very limited amount. Right, makes sense. And particularly given the fact you have offsetting daytime versus nighttime uses, you'd think there'd be a lot of opportunity for shared. Um, going to parking, uh, and if I recall correctly, we've now approved the elimination of parking minimums for, is it all housing? Uh, I believe. Uh, as, yeah, I'm just looking at staff about where we're at here in the city. Yeah, Mayor, could you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm just trying to recall where we're at, where our last council vote was. Have, have we directed staff to eliminate parking minimums across for all housing? We have. That's what I thought. We're okay. actually getting ready to come to And council. so we're waiting for that. It's November 29th with the final. Okay, the ordinance is coming. Good. <laughs> I wasn't sure where we were. We hadn't yet blessed the ordinance, but at least we all said go forward and, and do it. Okay, so... That's certainly positive, but what I keep hearing over and over is, you know, we have lots of wonderful developers. I can think of one who's got two different projects in title with zero parking, and they are not getting financing. And um, is there any kind of regional convening or conversation that could happen um, with, you know, I don't know if this, I mean, there's, I know there's too many out, entities out there doing the financing, to get everybody in a room, but I don't know if it's a ratings agencies or what, to say, hey, can we figure out ways that we're gonna agree to finance projects that are quote unquote under park? Well, is the city willing to sign a guarantee? <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, we, we don't think we take those risks. I know, that's, but maybe, I, I know that that's a non-starter because you can't have a contingent liability because it impact your bonding capacity. And yeah. you have to fund roads, schools, and much more equally important things. But I, I do think it's not worth completely dismissing outright. Maybe there are ways and layers of creating some type of surety, you know, in case of massive default or massive, some type of outside thing that maybe your controller or financial experts can find a way to layer in that doesn't impact your bonding capacity, but would provide some surety to the financing agencies. Because as Drew's um, graph showed, opportunistic, which is development, what we all want is the highest level of risk. Any way we can notch down that risk, maybe with some type of city or government uh, assistance, allows that money to be cheaper. And if that money's cheaper, then we can get housing built. Yeah, and you know, I'm thinking about on the, but both CalPERS and CalSTRS are some of the largest investors in real estate, as we all know. Right. Um, we also have some of the largest banks and lending institutions here in the state. So it may be worth your idea of a convening of really putting this in a sustainability lens because they're all working on, you know, basically three E's or to a bottom line, whatever you want to reference it. And to really just say, look, this is part of our sustainability mission as a state. Let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's figure out ways to encourage these lenders um, to allow for um, no parking or minimum parking. It sounds like a great idea for a ULI conference. Yeah, I mean, maybe okay. we I mean, maybe we need to think about it. <laughs> but uh, but I think it would in. take, I think the public sector would be a really important player to that, alongside of that. 
I was going to add one last thing. I mean, again, what Libby raised, and I, I, I know this might be a third rail. Um, you know, we're developers. We're here to ensure that money gets to deploy to build housing. Who owns it ultimately doesn't matter to us if the ultimate owner is a public entity. The JPA model, which they created to have a public entity own existing value at land, they didn't pay property tax. Whether or not that was abused or not, we can debate. But how do we turn that into production? Same concept. If a pension fund or another entity wants to own new housing production, it eliminates 50% of your operating costs. All of a sudden, the cost of housing and the revenue generated goes up. Um, and then we don't have to go through the whole state legislature and change the charter to increase the exemption levels of welfare tax. So that's something of great convening. How do we produce market rate housing that can be owned publicly but developed privately? so that we don't pay property tax. I think that is a game changer. Well, and I would add, so, um, since, since the topic has been opened, uh, I know that the, what we call the JPA model was studied by the city and, and uh, city of San Jose said, no, thank you. Um, and many other cities did as well. Uh, the, um, the model, because so many cities have grown skeptical of it, is being restudied, reimagined. Re, um, um, so that it is something that is much more sustainable going forward. Um, and the city being part of that discussion um, may be worthwhile. You know, there's a group doing it in San Mateo County um, that I'm aware of, and they are working with the cities collaboratively to understand what, what really does solve more problems and cause less problems with that type of ownership model. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I, I, you know, I hope, I won't be around, but I hope we accept that invitation because yeah. Um, I, I think, at least from my perspective, the concerns were less qualitative than quantitative in terms of where we are on the spectrum of risk. And um, yeah, I, I'd like to think there's a, a place where we could all get to to move that forward. Um, in any event, I, I always uh, learn something with every uh, convening of ULI, um, and I, this is no exception. So thank you all for uh, helping us learn. And I, I think. The one thing I mentioned, you know, you, you had a separate slide simply on the challenges of indecision um, in, in cities. And, I, you know, it was the very first thing I remember learning when I ran for, for office as a council member sitting down with Lou Wolf, and he said the one thing that no government understands is the cost of indecision. Uh, and it absolutely kills our ability to move forward. And, I, you know, I hope that we are embracing that uh, here in San Jose, that the cost of indecision, the, the time we take to get to a decision is the thing that is uh, absolutely uh, the, the biggest burden. Uh, so hopefully we will um, embrace the ability to decide quickly. <laughs> All right, uh, let's, let's move on. I don't see any hands except Councilmember Prowls. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to ULI as well. Uh, for the presentation. Just a couple questions. Uh, what is your assumed time for the return on investment? Uh, you're, you're utilizing that right throughout the presentation and in your, your evaluation calculations on, hey, there has to be a certain return on investment. What, what is the length of time that you've assumed in there for that return on investment? So I can speak to that. Um, there are a couple different metrics Return on cost is a static metric that does not include time. And that's simply, um, you know, how much income does a building generate over the total cost of creating that building? Uh, so that's, that's one metric. Investors often, regardless of their time horizon, whether it's five years, seven years, 10 years, or forever, um, do like to look at IRR, or the internal rate of return, which obviously is time dependent. Um, and so many investors, depending on whether they are in the business of investing of operating buildings when they buy them or development projects that uh, take much longer to create, will pick a time length, either seven years or 10 years. And even if their business plan is not to sell the building in year seven, they will run the model as though they do, just so that they can compare apples to apples to apples across their portfolio. Uh, but I would say return on cost and IRR are the two most common. Okay. Yeah, that, uh, it, it's helpful to, to understand that um, I've had two sort of what I feel are abnormal um, 
reality is that we, we have downtown one is that we have some major developers like uh, new developers like West Bank that appear as though they're willing to take a loss essentially right in, in the in the short term on breaking ground on, on, a, on a number of projects. And, and because the fact that they have numerous projects, um, I think they're right they're looking at playing the long game. And so that's why I was just kind of curious on you know, what that timeline might look like. I think it's it's unique. Uh, maybe you can confirm that when you have such a big developer that actually is looking at multiple developments versus just a one-off project um, that they're you know they're they're investing in a longer term uh, return on investment rather than just looking at one project. Happy to hear the, the thoughts on on how that that plays into it, sort of this big developer. You know. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I, I did not hear the developer that you were referring to. Oh, I was mentioning a West Bank. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and I, I can't speak to their particular outlook, but there are certainly um, groups that are large enough where they may say, um, our development activity in a place like downtown San Jose is going to be so impactful that it is going to, uh, it's going to change the nature of downtown. Um, and, you know, everything that's going on around Diridon Station is an example of that, something of such a scale that it will change the entirety of downtown or, or you know, some of the characteristics of that sub-neighborhood. Um, and so, yes, they may not look at it on one particular building, but on a longer term strategy. Uh, public REITs are able to look at a much longer term strategy. And then of course there are some private investors, um, not always necessarily housing related, but uh, the Sobrato organization is obviously a, a bright shining example of somebody who um, you know, is typically a long term investor. Mm -hmm. uh, but not every developer does that. Some, um, and I would say the, the impact of structured finance or um, more institutional dollars in real estate Again, we'll look at five, seven, and ten-year time horizons um, in their underwriting. Thank you. The other um, curiosity that I have is you, you uh, demonstrated the examples of of this residual land value, and uh, what I'm curious about is the the scenarios where either you have somebody that's that's owned land for decades, literally, uh, right, maybe passed down through family or whatever it may be. And so the, the, the residual, residual land value for them at this point, right, is, is maybe not, not a factor, but yet they still, right, aren't, aren't developing. So it's, it's obviously the, the other factors are costing too much. Similarly, uh, I think we have a lot of entitlements and that, that are not breaking ground. Is that, you know, the residual land value at that point, my understanding, it doesn't make a difference because the other factors are what are just making a project infeasible to break ground. Is that, that's an easy assumption or the right assumption? It can be a, um, a number of things. As Eric alluded to during the presentation, there may be an existing use that's not particularly glamorous, whether it's a surface parking lot, whether it's, um, you know, a retail establishment that's uh, long in the tooth, if that existing use generates a decent amount of income relative to the value of the land or, the, or um, you know, relative to what could be done there, um, it may be a better alternative to leave it as is. So even though the land residual- okay. Like you started off saying that the, the car wash stays the car wash, whatever, right? It just sort of- it, it, Yes, and, and there okay. are examples of folks who own car washes and they say, if I were gonna build a new building, I would have to invest tens of millions of dollars or more, I would have to put my, um, you know, the family wealth that's been created over generations at stake because development is such a risky proposition. And so um, the easier decision sometimes in those scenarios is to keep operating a car wash. That, that makes sense. But we also, we have a number of just vacant properties that also have been, you know, either long entitled or long held by the same property owner um and and have yet to see any movement on development um and again some with entitlements of of you know so anyways it just that that's kind of always uh, you know uh, my understanding has got to be right these other factors this this cost of construction the the the, the fees um right the charges coming through the city uh because the land value in my, in my mind in some of these these cases is has, has been taken out of the, the equation um so if you don't have that that you know 
uh, value coming in on the land because they it's just it's uh, vacant. Then again, it, it the only other reason why something may not be breaking ground is because these other factors. Is that it? It is the case, and and what Libby's slide didn't show, um, there are cases where a land residual will return a negative value, and um, and it just means the project's not financeable. So without a subsidy of some kind, so that may be the case in the the vacant parcels you're thinking of. Got it. And and, a lo and unfortunately, one of the aftermaths of Prop 13 is that there are a number of um, retail properties, often commercial properties, that have been owned for a very long period of time, have a very low tax base, and so the cost of carrying those properties is quite low. And that often is tied with those properties that remain vacant a long time and don't get redeveloped. That's, that's one case. Another case that I'm very familiar with from some of the work that I do is properties have been owned by a family for a long time. They go into a trust situation or they're owned by a number of family members where it's just complicated to unwind it and sell it because, um, and also the tax implications are hard. So you have to make the deal, the deal has to command a lot more revenue than you would think it might have to command just based on, on the fact that there's, it's not generating any revenue. It actually has to buy out uh, family interests or it has to pay for taxes or both together. Okay, yeah, no, thank you. Those Makes sense, um, especially the, the Prop 13 one. I know um, that's actually come up conversation before, but um, I guess I hadn't really put two and two together on what properties we may have throughout at least the downtown core that uh, that could be a, a, a big factor. Um, but I know some of them have been, you know, owned for, for many, many years and decades. And so that that likely is a a factor. Another reason to uh, to update Prop 13, but um, <laughs> that you you mentioned a number of things that I think uh, from the local to the the state and even federal level that could help um, policy wise um, and uh, appreciate that uh, you know coloring the, the conversation here um, because I do think you know we've um, you know we we've taken up a number of those topics you mentioned um, rent control being entering the fun one I I I thought well before that uh, you had already entered a number of fun conversations that the Council here has dove into um, on um, you know on on housing development, uh, but appreciate the uh, discussion and look forward to staff portion. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Uh, kind of makes me want to after the meeting, go home and dust off some of my old real estate books uh, from when I took uh, courses from Ken Rosen at, uh, at the Fisher Center. Um, I wanna uh, kind of take this at a higher level. Um, you described some of the, the levers or tools that we'll be able to use to, to be able to help these projects move forward. Um, the conversations that have taken place over the, the years I've been on council, there's a, a sentiment and certain parts of uh, the community as well as on council that you know there's a fear that we're just going to leave you know money on the table for the developers uh, can you kind of help me understand the process of how whatever model or tools that you're going to provide us or or make recommendations how we can you know land on whatever that that model or uh, framework is because Right now, the only thing that we have to work with is the developers don't build or they don't move these projects forward. So that's our only uh, indication of we're not at the right place. How can we use the tools that you're gonna provide us to be able to come up with that right place or, or what I'd call a sweet spot? Hey, let me respond to, and please chime in. I, I wanna respond to the high level. Uh, having been doing real estate, housing development, all of us here 20 plus years each, in the beginning, when I was doing this, everyone looked at housing as coming to cities and the housing developers were extracting value out of the city. We're coming here to profit from the city to build housing. As, hus as the cost of housing has changed and as the cities have started to look at housing developers as a means of extracting value from them, it's becoming less and less feasible. So I think that's the first kind of mindset I see changing now that 
we need to look at it more as a partnership. And I think that's what we're doing here, a partnership between um, government and developers, private developers, to see how housing can be built instead of kind of a quid pro quo. Um, and I'll, I'll share my thought on uh, how to ensure some type of fairness in ensuring that everyone is paying into the cost of housing. Um, the, res the residual land value analysis is a good one. We want to know that it's not going to be a car wash. We want to know the cost of housing development is not so heavy, so, so impactful that the land stays a car wash. So that's one way of measuring. At this price, this price of land, it'll transact to become housing above a car wash or parking lot. That means the cost of building the housing can't be more than, than this. You know, as Libby's graphic, and maybe you can explain it more eloquently. That's one way of trying to measure that we're, we're getting enough benefits without overburdening the cost that no land will ever become housing. I, I would just add that, um, you know, the, the reality is in the next 6, 12, 18 months, there may be very little that, that can spur activity immediately because um, the capital markets are, are, have a, a very grim outlook um, with respect to, um, you know, new development investment relative to the cost. And, and that is going to change, but to your point, you know, I, I, I would caution you on overreacting in the next six to 12 months, um, and then all of a sudden you see a lot of activity um, and, and the answer moves too quickly and you can't stop it fast enough or you can't, you can't control it. What I think San Jose has done in the past and could continue to do are temporary measures where you have um, abatement of fees or you have incentives with a short-term nature. And, and some of it may have to be trial and error where you say, okay, in the downtown, we're gonna offer these incentives, but only for the next 12 months. And you see how many permits you get within that 12 month period or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and those are things that if, if you get feedback that it's working, but 12 months isn't long enough, you can extend it. If you get feedback that it's not working at all, you try something else. Um, so I, I think short-term incentives or short-term um, programs may be a way to uh, modulate the gas pedal, so to speak. And then I have a, an, an additional, it's kind of a, a different way of thinking about this too, is, and we don't look at this often enough, is how many developers are repeat developers in your community? How many people have really st stayed around for the long term? Like Sobrato obviously was mentioned and has been a stalwart for the South Bay. But that should be a real test, is to have good developers continue to develop in the city over time and stay with the city. And if that's not occurring, if it's a one-off, um, then it's, it's really a problem. And what I try to sometimes say to my public clients is, don't make it so difficult, don't make it so onerous that you'll never get that developer to come back in the door again. And we don't often think of it that way, but they're your customers just like the public is your customers. I know the public doesn't see it that way. I know, I mean, I came from a place where I thought developers were, you know, were evildoers, you know, and raping the landscape, whatever it was. But if you really think about it, they are the ones that are going to make our world a better place, literally, if we allow them to do it, and we allow them to do a good job, and we want good development to be be moving forward. So I think it's really that partnership idea, just building on what Eric said. I mean, we at ULI are here to be your partners. We have great members. We are dedicated as an organization to, um, to making communities thrive and trying to have good development move forward. So we want to, it's in our best interest and your best interest to see if we can get repeat development to occur over the long period of time. And, and whatever ends up being the short-term incentive, does it then turn into a long-term relationship that you can build upon, um, just like anything else? And I'm not sure if it, this distinction needs to be made, but the affordable housing component is, doesn't go, uh, doesn't have quite these steep sort of market vacillations. We are a pretty steady customer. Um, there's all manner of um, contractors, general contractors in this region that kind of like us for that reason, because we 
There are some years where I literally was the only person pulling a build, building permit for the whole city. Um, and so we, uh, we, we're pretty consistent on that front. Um, and so I, I guess what I would say in terms of what tools could we offer, you know, looking at some of the state streamlining tools and seeing how the city has used them, SB 35 is still a relatively new innovation. You have done a few of these deals. There are little areas uh, to procedurally smooth that out because it, uh, it has to move all the way through the city. So once it's entitled, and you're, you're through the planning and that process, it, uh, it needs to kind of continue to flow in through the building department and all the plan check and processing and permit. So there's a lot of places I think with, um, uh, that we could continue to look to really uh, tighten up that, those timelines and the certainty um, and, and, and take some of the promise of these tools and, and you know, perfect them. Actually, uh, thanks for that. Um response that actually triggers another question. And I, I ask developers this question all the time, and I still don't get it. Um, when, you know, we, obviously we go through cycles, market cycles, and when we're in a down cycle, there's a pullback in the capital markets in terms of, you know, financing these projects. When it would seem like that would be the, the best time to undertake a project, when labor costs, material costs, and all the other costs are, are less, you know, obviously you, got, you can't time the market, but if, if we go look at history, you know, we go through market cycles and there's a good chance that you'll complete your project somewhat, somewhere around the time of the market improving or being in an up cycle. So can somebody explain to me why the capital markets don't take advantage of that? You should be a developer. That, uh, we, we, we pound the table with that message. We, I, I can give you an example. In the great financial crisis, we had a project that was ready to go in the middle of 2009, uh, and I won't name the investor, but a life insurance company was our investor, and we literally were banging on the table saying, this is the best time to build. And they looked at us and they said, we can't build right now because nobody else is building. And they were scared to look silly, honestly. And um, we got an investment committee approval to build that project almost a year later to the day, and cost had gone up 15%, the hard cost had gone up 15% in that one year. And um, so it, it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to go forward when nobody's going forward. And um, you know some of it is regulation, the banks are regulated, they, uh, part of the reason the banking industry right now is worried is that they see um, potential defaults coming, and it may be a default in the office sector, but when the federal government stress tests the bank and the bank um, needs to reserve more cash for those potentially troubled projects, it hamstrings their ability to fund a new great housing development in San Jose, even if a new great housing development in San Jose is a good financial proposition. Um, so it's, it's interconnectivity, it's regulation, it's, um, you know, it can be a lot of things, but it, it is the most difficult time to convince people to go forward, and we, like you, believe that more people should be going forward at these times. Okay, I, I'm glad to hear that uh, my assumption was correct. That it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> oh, no. Don't know that I can go that far. But. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it that far, but, th but thank you. That's it, that's in Mayor. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions from my colleagues? Oh uh, yes, can, yeah, I, can I just uh, I just wanted to weigh in a little bit. Thank you for the master class on development and the cost of development. It was really helpful. We have a lot of potential construction going on, we think, and to understand what the triggers are that are standing in the way from a developer actually pulling the trigger and getting the financing they need and all the other costs is really um, helpful. But I add, um, you mentioned that the market doesn't like uncertainty. None of us like uncertainty, certainly in the investment market, but, and that a developer needs predictability and consistency. So, but you also mentioned that maybe temporary incentives are the way to go. To me, that they don't go together. A temporary incentive doesn't provide certainty, doesn't provide consistency or predictability. It does for a short term, but if we lock it into that particular development, it does. But if we don't lock it in to that particular development, there is no uncertainty. So how do we eliminate from our side? We can't address the capital market. 
We can't lower interest rates. We cannot decrease the cost of land. That's going to happen over market conditions. We cannot affect the employment market or the cost of materials. But, but policies are things we can change, and you've provided us a lot of, of ideas, but how do we add certainty? How do we create predictability and certainty for our developers? So f first of all, you're not wrong that consistency and short-term changes are incongruent. <laughs> um, but maybe let me think about it this way. Um, most often the consistency uh, that we think about is in land use and planning. And the idea of there is a downtown, there is an area of town next to a park or next to transit where the city would like to see certain types of uses. And consistency in that type of long-term planning maybe is the best place to, to apply the consistency aspect. Um, the short-term levers may be when you want that long-term plan to come into play faster than it's coming. And so you're going to make a change that affects the financial feasibility to try to be a catalyst and make more projects go forward that may, in fact, be consistent with that long-term plan. Does that answer your question? Yes, <laughs> such as reducing parking minimums and, and other requirements that we may be implementing for really good reasons or haven't implemented yet but need to implement in, in a much bigger way. Of course, reducing parking minimums decreases the cost for the developer, but it's also good for the environment because it decreases the incentive of having your vehicles out and living in a vehicle a society driven by the automobile. So there's lots of reasons that removing parking minimums. Well, I th I th this is really interesting. I know there's other things coming forward to us that will address specific fees. But is there, what's the one recommendation that you have for us, or are you going to make it later, to, of how we're going to solve this problem, how we're going to create predictability with our developers? This is why you're here and you pulled in, you're pulling in the big bucks. I, I think I caveated this presentation at the beginning that we didn't have the silver bullet. Oh, come on. <laughs> I, I, I would think maybe you should break it up into two, two parts. Let's look at future entitlements. Creating certainty, how do we create a precise plan for the city? How do we ensure long-term predictability so we have repeat customers of developers coming to downtown San Jose? And let's look at our current problem. The sites that are already entitled, that are stuck, as I think Vice Mayor Jones pointed out, Mayor Licardo pointed out, there are multiple stuck projects. Those are what can benefit what Drew's talking about, the short-term. The short-term um, incentives to get stuck projects built and, you know, Again, these are the things that no one wants to talk about, reducing um, affordability requirements, reducing parking requirements, reducing retail, maybe eliminating sales tax for materials that the city would collect, things like that. These would be short term. And then the long term would be cre creating predictability for future planning entitlement. Okay. I think I want to put a plug Thank in here for your housing element too. Um, I have worked um, for uh, I, I, I was the and am the mid pen housing element person. So when all jurisdictions want to seek that input, um, I have done this for several cycles now. And um, you, you mentioned that we can't decrease the cost of land, but that's exactly what you can do through your housing element, um, either by looking at sites that were not originally housing sites, uh, church parking lots. Uh, and another um, kind of beloved place to look is uh, quasi-public land, if it's uh, school district-owned land, or uh, your other public partners that may be trying to house their employees or their workforce. Um, these are great places to look. Uh, schools already do not pay uh, taxes at the same rate, so uh, this JPA model that was kind of discussed a few times and uh, woven into the conversation already applies. And, they, um, they know how much they pay their employers, which is one of the major things that we're all trying to always guess, you know, who, who are we building for? So I think that there are opportunities to look at where you have land within the city, and I know that staff is kind of in the midst of, of, of one of the best tools. And it can be hard to uh, recommit to looking at that because it seems so academic or far away, but um, over and over and over again we have sites that uh, when the market conditions are right, they, they build out. Um, and that the, if using that particular tool to remove a few of the key constraints um, 
It doesn't matter now that the state environment has, has shifted so much. You can still look at where the constraints are today and try to open the aperture, so. Thank you. All right, uh, any other comments? I have Paralysis' hand up on Yes, it is. It, Councilor Paralysis, is that from before, or is that a new question? Sorry, that, that is from before. Okay, thank you. Great, um, and I appreciate uh, the, the dialogue, which was, uh, I think, very helpful. Um, the last question I just wanted to throw in, since retail's been mentioned a couple of times, and that's a, something I've been clinging to for a long time, um, like Charlton Heston to a gun or something. Um, so I, I, I appreciate this is a burden for affordable builders and for market rate builders, having these, these retail spaces and of course nobody wants it to be vacant and i'm just wondering is there new thinking emerging about how we can fill these spaces with active uses that aren't necessarily i mean frankly housing isn't really active it's not <laughs> you're especially if you're in an urban area where people have safety concerns you're never going to lease out that space that's right well depending obviously on a lot of circumstances it's going to be very challenging right um, so, you know, whether it's daycare or it's a gym or it's something, um, is there some place where developers uh, can be at peace <laughs> with the notion that we want active space that's not housing at the base of a building? I mean, I think you hit a, a, a that's a possibility. We, we have talked about putting them in any spaces. Mm -hmm on the ground floor, the gym, the clubhouse, different parts of the amenity spaces, but currently most jurisdictions won't permit it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, because of retail requirements or? Because of retail requirements, public, yeah. So it can be a private gym or a private uh, clubhouse uh, that serves the building community. Mm -hmm. I, I would tell you some of the most creative things we've seen, um, for some reason my mind is picturing a, a block in Santa Monica where uh, they had a grocery store parking garage, and they put effectively pop-up businesses along right. the sidewalk. The sidewalk was deep enough, and the pop-up businesses were literally, think of um, something a lot better looking, but a kiosk in a mall, where huh. it folded up against the garage, Yeah. and when it pulled out, it allowed a business to exist for the day, and it was only taking up four to six feet off the edge of the garage, and there was still plenty of sidewalk left for people to walk past, but if that business is viable, it'll be there all day and it'll be active. If that business is not viable, when you fold it down, it's arguably more attractive than the side of the garage. So it, it, we always ask, what are you really after? Are you after the retail tax revenue? Are you after the use that's in a traditional space? Or are you after the, the activation of the street scene? And, and depending on what the real goal is, there are different ways to accomplish it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that quasi retail space or that flexible retail space, especially today with technology and what pop ups can do and how quickly businesses can move around. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a very strict. Uh, and we've certainly piloted that ourselves along San Pedro Street, for example, mm -hmm. where we've had. Yeah. So it's yeah. something we're very familiar with. Uh, I see Rosen and Nancy nodding their heads. Uh, so so certainly I think there's a lot of opportunity here. I just hate for us to say we're going to give up on ground floor activation. Uh, obviously, we'd love the tax but, revenue. We really want the people. Yeah, but I, but I would I, I would say there is the move to do more live work, and you know within that structure, which does have some activity. Another idea that's been been popping up more is Popo's privately owned public open space that does activate during the day, um, but does it will close at night, but um, most probably depending on the requirements. But it does provide an urban oasis for people that I think is really important. And I think in your downtown, you don't know, maybe could use some more of those, those really great, um, you know, Pobo spaces mm -hmm. that um, some of them could become. So I think there are some creative uses that will provide activation, but not necessarily, and, and can be accompanied by a, a coffee shop or whatever else that's in there, whether it's a pop up or not, um, that can activate without doing retail and I, I, child care is in high demand and we would love to put child care in our buildings and i think child care providers can actually pay rent 
problem is the state requirements for the open space. Yeah. If we can figure out a way to do urban infill child care. Right. I think we all benefit from that. Right. You essentially need to go carve out a bunch of space out of your surface level parking lot to have kids run around safely somehow. Right. Understood. Okay. Appreciate those are challenges are not easy to solve. I, I might just add that, you know, Mid-10 has, I think, six communities where we have a child care center on the ground floor. Communities like Redwood City that actually have a fee generator to build new um, child care that can help contribute as a source is a, it's a useful mechanism that you might want to consider. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I know we've been trying this on a couple projects to try to get affordable projects to bite. I think we've got two. Is that right? Yes, we we actually in our most recent um, notice of funding availability, we have three pro, um, affordable Great. developments that include childcare. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's really promising. Thank you, Rachel. All right, well thank you everybody. Uh, very helpful, informative. Okay, so now we should go to staff. Is that right? Okay, Nancy. Mayor, Council, thank you very much. Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development, Cultural Affairs. Just a big thank you from us, too, to the panel. Very experienced, very knowledgeable, and very excited that a lot of the conversations that the panel is speaking about, whether it be PQP or driving uh, that processes that allow affordable first or only on certain properties, many or most of the things that the panel mentioned, the city at the uh, mayor and council's leadership are already engaged in. As we turn to the staff presentation, what Jared and Rachel will be doing is providing highlights of the report that covers the cost of residential development, both market rate and affordable. And the messages from the report and that you've read are consistent with the themes you've heard from the panel. Residential development right now is challenging. And the city, as you heard, does not have control of the major factors. There are pieces that we do have control over, and some of that is even difficult, like hiring and keeping uh, employees to make things go faster. So there are also additional staff-identified uh, effects or uh, projects that we believe could have significant impact that practically, though, will, will impact in the mid to longer term, aside from some of the incentive things that we're already speaking about. So, so with that, Jared and Rachel will have more to share about the report that was completed. Thanks, Nancy. So just to start with some background, um, in April of 2018, the city council held a study session, received the first cost of development report. The first report came as staff was developing the housing crisis work plan that would later be approved in June of 2018. And the housing crisis work plan included an ongoing work item to update the cost of residential development on a regular basis. The results of the first report suggested new residential development was challenged in most areas of the city However, new residential development in West San Jose was found to be feasible and development in downtown and North San Jose yielded positive returns, but those returns were marginal and potentially insufficient to attract investment. In, in 2019, an updated report was presented to the city council. This report found similar results as to the previous, suggesting that development remained feasible with West San Jose and development in downtown and North San Jose remained marginal. The most significant barrier at that time identified was the cost of construction. The 2019 report also included, it, included an analysis of affordable housing for the first time. The report looked at the average cost of construction for affordable units in San Jose compared to other cities, utilizing data submitted to the state by projects receiving tax credit financing. Entering 2020, staff intended to update the report in conjunction with its continued work on the housing crisis work plan. However, the work was delayed by the pandemic. The work to update th this current study was initiated in early 2022 with the, with the city's consultant, Century Urban. And so as first panel, we talked about quite a bit. And, um, 
the continued updates are, are important uh, to, the, to the city and as a tool to help us continue to understand the barriers to new housing construction. The updates provide a deeper understanding of the factors both outside and within the city's control that impact the feasibility of residential development. These factors can contribute to our ability to deliver on our housing goals. Factors within the city's control include impact fees, construction taxes, and the permitting approval process for projects. Factors outside the city's control um, relate to the economic conditions, uh, such as the cost of construction and interest rates, among others. Understanding all of these factors can help inform our policy decisions relating to housing production. As was the case in the previous iterations, the report is based on conceptual prototypes. These are not actual developments, but reflect typical characteristics of recent multifamily development in the city. The data and assumptions for specific projects are not available to the city. Developers generally treat this information as proprietary and do not share it with the city or with the public. The report looks at market rate rental and for sale, for sale multifamily in three different prototypes, a five-story low-rise building, a seven-story mid-rise building, and a 22-story high-rise. It is important to distinguish between these types as each requires a different type of construction that affects costs. These prototypes are then analyzed in several different areas of the city to test for feasibility. The results of the report are shown as residual land values. As a reminder from the panel's presentation, residual land value refers to the amount of value remaining to purchase land once all other costs have been accounted for to complete construction. This includes hard costs, which is the materials and labor to construct, soft costs, which include taxes, city fees, and design costs, then a return on investment. A positive residual value indicates the amount of development could pay for land and still be considered feasible. A residual value that is zero or negative indicates a development that is infeasible as there is no remaining value to purchase land. Fortunately, the results of our updated analysis show all residual values as negative in the prototypes tested. These values are shown on a per unit basis. These values mean that no prototype was shown to be feasible. Um, the negative values indicate that even if land were available at no cost, the development would still not be feasible. The results show an extremely challenging market in the current conditions for multifamily housing in San Jose. The report's findings are validated through the recent experience of the city shown in our building permit data. This chart shows recent multifamily development with over 50 units since 2020. There were two developments that started early in 2020, and then through the pandemic, only one project per year has started construction. The second chart here provides more context looking back to 2015 at the number of units per calendar year in projects over 50 units. You can see the downward trend starting to some extent in 2019, related, likely related to construction costs, and then the substantial drop in 2020 through today. The, co the cost of construction remains a significant barrier. This chart shows the cost per unit for the mid-rise prototype in West San Jose. In 2018 and 2019, the results suggested that this, this prototype was feasible. However, the significant increases in cost have made it infeasible today. An index provided to the city by our consultant that tracks construction costs in the Bay Area has shown a 17% increase since the start of the pandemic through the second quarter of 2022. Additionally, since that time, interest rates have continued to add further challenges to the cost of new construction. And rent growth, another, the other uh, side of the equation um, is important as well. Rents dropped at the start of the pandemic and did not fully recover in San Jose until spring of 2022. Rent growth since the pandemic has started is estimated at 5% which is not sufficient to mass, match the increases in the cost of construction over that time in San Jose. The largest component of the city added cost to development are impact fees and construction taxes. Based on the cost of the prototypes in the analysis, these costs represent five and a half to 10% of the total cost per unit. 
These numbers are marginal compared to the overall cost of the unit, but they still add costs and contribute to infeasibility. Reduction of these taxes and fees to zero dollars in the current environment would not fundamentally change the outcome of the analysis. However, staff believes it is important to understand the cost implications of all policy decisions in the near term and that no new costs be added to construction that would further contribute to infeasibility. And with that, I'll hand it to Rachel. Thank you, Jared. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, again, this is Rachel Vanerveen, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. The second study completed by Century Urban is the Affordable Housing Development Cost Study. As the cost of construction rises for all residential development, affordable housing is impacted along the way. Actual costs for affordable housing development are, all, are available due to public documents posted by the state for any tax credit awards. So in this case, our consultant pulled actual information from 15 San Jose developments representing over 1,700 units and compared this to 27 affordable developments throughout the state of California. Review of this information demonstrated the average per unit cost of affordable housing in San Jose is $615,000. The average height for these developments was seven stories. This is 15% higher than developments across the state. When you break the data down further and evaluate the cost for special needs housing, the average actually grows to 700,000 per unit. This is, due for, this is due to the need for services space within, within the development and also larger units. The prior study completed by Kaiser Marston in 2019 reported the average cost for special needs units was 523,000. But in that time period, the majority of units evaluated were studios. Since that time, the city has incentivized housing for families with multiple bedrooms, and this trend continues to push the price per unit up. Also, I would like to point out that when we met with developers in person to review the results of our study now, they stated that these numbers are really looking backwards. As they look forward, they're seeing that costs are nearing $900,000 per unit in San Jose. So I just want to state that, um, again, these costs are just growing almost daily. Next slide, please. There are general trends that continue to provide pressure on the cost for affordable housing development. First, the construction costs have increased each year by 6%. Second, the recent increase in inflation rates have significantly impacted affordable housing development costs. As described by Nevada in the prior presentation, many affordable housing developments have five and six funding sources and can take two to three years just to secure all the funds. This in itself adds cost to the project. And third, San Jose has continued to prioritize funding for our most vulnerable residents, and this deepens the affordability and results in higher costs as well. Next slide, please. As a part of the housing crisis work plan discussion, this, oh, hold on, sorry. This study also considered the cost of development in other jurisdictions across California. Overall, the average cost was 15% higher than in of than other affordable developments in other parts of our, our state. The reasons identified um, for this include the priority for deeper affordability. Um, the direct construction costs are actually higher in San Jose due to a shortage in construction labor force and our prevailing wage requirements. Also, impact fees in San Jose um, actually averaged 12,000 per unit versus 7,800 in other communities. And finally, San Jose has higher financing costs. As projects become more complex, the cost to finance also increase. So as a part of the housing crisis work plan discussion, which is coming up in just two weeks, the city is planning on bringing forward a recommendation to increase the per unit subsidy, which has been um, stably $125,000 per unit for um, over four years now. 
The reason for this increase is, is really twofold. The increased cost of development is the first, and second, the reality that the county's Measure A funds are now being quickly depleted. Considering all of the factors that we have talked about today, it is just clear we need to seriously consider strategies to reduce cost. It will, um, it will take multiple actions all at the same time in order to achieve this goal. And we want to engage this challenge and work with you together to find ways to manage this problem. And now I'd like to turn it back to Jared. As Rachel mentioned at the November 15th city council meeting, there will be several policy items related to this report. This includes our, uh, an update on the housing crisis work plan and also recommendations on the future of the city's downtown high-rise residential program. There are also other future policy actions planned in 2023, including consideration of a construction tax reduction for affordable housing, as was discussed with the council earlier in 2022. This is important now, uh, given the analysis um, that we just discussed um, in the report that showed San Jose with higher per unit fees for affordable housing units than in other jurisdictions. Additionally, the development fee framework is intended to better align our most significant impact fees and taxes to allow for easier calculation and administration. Staff plans to bring forward a council policy and other changes to memorialize the components of the development fee framework in the fall of 2023. Overall, the report shows that new housing construction, especially in the near term, is significantly challenged due to factors outside the city's control. In the longer term, staff has included two significant strategies in the proposed updated housing element to help speed up the approval of new housing. This includes creation of a city ministerial approval ordinance that would allow housing projects meeting specific criteria to be approved without a hearing through a ministerial process. Projects utilizing this process would not be subject to CEQA review as ministerial approvals are not defined as projects in CEQA statute. Additionally, the other strategy is to conduct program level CEQA analysis for approved urban village plans. This would help shorten the approval process by reducing the amount of environmental analysis required for individual projects. This approach has been a successful component of the city's downtown strategy. Um, so with that, that concludes staff's presentation. Representatives from the city's consultant, Century Urban, are also available uh, via Zoom if there are specific questions related to the report. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for all the hard work, and uh, I know we're gonna be considering some of that work next week, and hopefully we'll move forward quickly. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the public, and then we'll come back to the council for questions and comments. Comment. Yeah, caller 1324. One, two, three, or one, three, two, uh, yes, this is uh, yes, this is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, it's very rare that I hear people lie as much as I did today, but these are lies. This is a propaganda tool. For those of you that don't know how to identify what propaganda is, what you just heard is propaganda. Okay, because the only time that I have heard people lie as much as I heard today is when a lawyer is talking or when a politician is talking. And this city just happens to have both in their mayor. So that means we're lied to a lot. I mean, a lot. Okay. Market rate housing needs to be capped at 50%. Why? Because all that has been happening is market rate housing goals have been met constantly year after year. 15 95% to 115%. ELI, VLI, bottom. That's number one. Number two is what this is, is a tool by developers to try to normalize giving them tax breaks. We already gave you dudes 9 million and then we gave you 4 million. Uh-uh. I don't want no more tax breaks. I did hear an argument, though, about repealing uh, Prop 13. That I did hear. I heard that loud and clear. Okay, but developers are the problem. Why? Because developing is what created San Jose. Manifest Destiny was about land takeovers and coming and exploiting this land. And this land has not been healed from that start point. 
okay, you can throw a rock anywhere in the city and make money with the land. But the land has never been, re- oh the, the land has never been healed from the decapitations of Native Americans. And that is the foundation. Aaron? Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Eckhouse. I'm the regional policy manager at California Yimby. Uh, really glad that San Jose is looking at this issue. Uh, I think the report that's been presented today represents kind of a disaster for San Jose. If new housing is not feasible anywhere in the city, that's a huge crisis. And I think it needs a, a commensurate policy response. Uh, a couple of things I noticed that are interesting, I have questions about. One, really glad that the city is looking at streamlining the approval process and using ministerial approval as a way to uh, address this issue. I do think that indicates the need to move the timeline for that up. I think in the housing element, it's currently proposed to not happen until 2026 or 2027. And based on this report, we need it sooner. Uh, I'm also curious about um, moderate density development in the city. So there was a report that the city commissioned a year or two ago uh, that indicated from Opticos, indicated that six to eight plexes are financially feasible in much of San Jose and would potentially produce housing affordable to middle income households. So I'm curious if uh, staff and the consultants think that report is still accurate. And if so, does that indicate a uh, possible policy response to help enable housing in more of uh, San Jose? Um, and then I think a, I, I'm also just sort of curious about the idea that uh, some of the higher costs we saw here were about Bay Area specific factors in the affordable housing report, given the fact that most of the comparison cities were also in the Bay Area. Uh, generally, though, I think this is a huge problem. We need a policy response, uh, not just looking at fees, but at zoning, permitting, the building code. All of that needs to be considered. Jean Dresden. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jean Dresden. This financial analysis provides guidance towards a system of many solutions and reaffirms that fee cuts alone don't work. Compact solutions are needed, including using new legislation and the pro-housing designation elements that bring federal and state dollars. Yesterday, Turner released their new dashboard models showing the significantly greater impact of strategies other than fee cuts, and they modeled synergistic effects. However, the council must focus staff on completing the housing element as its greatest priority so that state and federal financing does not end and the fewest number of builders remedy projects are submitted. The city must look at downtown beyond fee cuts. Gensler's research shows that the city must provide the staffing needed to help public life businesses rebuild and fully fund the reinvigoration of the downtown public plazas and parks that are needed to attract the knowledge workers to retain and stay and pay full market rate that attracts equity investors. Importantly, park fees have not increased since 2017, and inflation impacts have reduced their value by more than 35%, a silent discount. Initiatives such as converting NCC sites to mixed use should be considered, but all should be prioritized through the lens of number of units built and the lack of planning staff available to do the work. Brian? Hello, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Brian Pores with UA Local 393, representing thousands of San Jose plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, HVR, HVACR, service technicians, and our families. Today, I'm here to impress the importance of skilled and trade labor, labor being part of this conversation and our future in San Jose. In 2018, Working Partnerships produced a study that documented the cost to our community due to the low road development model that dominates private, private development, particularly in residential construction. It should outrage every member of this council that little has changed since then. 
the report told you that over half, 54% specifically, of blue collar construction workers employed in the Santa Clara County earn less than 40,000 per year with few or no benefits. Non-union contractors also are the key players when it comes to wage theft, misclassification, and unsafe work conditions. More importantly, it depletes the economic development during and after the project. Workers who are brought in from outside will not buy local, do not reside local, and all the while push out our local skilled and trained workers. The report also noted that Latino and African-American construction workers are paid 38% less than white workers on average. Therefore, to ensure our future is being built in a responsible manner that pay fair wages with fair conditions, I ask that your staff provide alternatives to fee waivers that include employing our local skilled and trained workforce. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Louise Auerhahn. Hello, good afternoon, Mayor Council members. Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships. And my comments today will focus on the consultant study that was commissioned and on the downtown high rise subsidy that's planned to come back in two weeks. Uh, so that subsidy for downtown high rise developers was first pitched as a temporary stimulus to help jumpstart downtown development during the Great Recession. That was around 2009. Since then, it's been extended over and over and over for 13 years. And every time it's been promised, this is just temporary. This is because of market conditions. And every time it's promised, we'll find another way to make up for the affordable housing. And so far, every time that promise has been broken. At this point, well over 100 million in subsidies has been granted through this program, uh, maybe much more. I've never seen the city provide a cumulative total. But we keep trying the same approach over and over again, putting more and more into these subsidies, and it's not working. It's not working to produce housing that's affordable for our neighborhoods. We're woefully behind our affordable housing goals. It's not working to produce good jobs. Four years after council voted in 2018 to attach workforce standards to subsidies, nothing's been done. And from the consultant report we just saw, Every type of development, including those subsidized high rises is now infeasible. So it doesn't look like it's working to spur development either. Uh, so if we've been doing this over and over again for 13 years, and this is where it's gotten us, isn't it time to step back and try something new? Uh, but this consultant study, if you read the paragraph on page three, legislative background, it was prepared with the specific purpose of providing findings to support a continued fee and tax reduction. So the study didn't look at other solutions. The panel was very refreshing and I'd urge the city to come. Mundo. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mayor, City Council. I, I am Edmundo Scarcega. I'm with UA Local 393, representing thousands of San Jose plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, and HVACR technicians and their families. Today, I'm here to impress the importance of skilled and trained labor being a part of this conversation and our future here in San Jose. The report in front of you today accepts racial disparities by accept accepting as a matter of fact that developers will build into their pro formas a bidding process that results in the use of low road contractors that, that in our area have already been proven to exploit out of town workers. Let's be clear. Residential investors seeking a 15 to 20% return exploiting San Jose's construction workforce has become an acceptable method for them to compete for that capital. This is a matter of choice for the de developers, not because the cost of construction here demands it. It's simply a choice to put profit over people. That's profit over our local workforce, profit over safety, profit over our community's future. To allow for reduced fees, and tax breaks without addressing the harm done to thousands of construction workers is simply wrong. Your, sta your staff should supply alternative strategies to encouraging the rapid construction of residential projects. They're out there. Additionally, we believe, reduction we believe reductions of fees and taxes should trigger a prevailing wage requirement. You should have your legal counsel make a determination on this concern. Thank you very much. Eric? Good evening, Mayor Licardo, members of the council. This is Eric Shaneauer. 
I just wanted to note that some people are arguing uh, to the council that this report was done during the pandemic and therefore it is invalid and should not be relied upon to uh, make policy decisions. Uh, so I just want to emphasize the fact that the city has completed two prior cost of development reports, one in 2018, the other in 2019, and both of those reports pretty much came to the same conclusion um, prior to the pandemic. Uh, in addition, housing production has in San Jose has been extremely anemic. Uh, the city is underproducing housing even before the pandemic. Let me give you some numbers. You could write them down. In 2018, the city issued building permits for 2,973 units. In 2019, the city issued building permits for 2,663 units. Put that in context. Your stated city council goal is to generate 5,000 units per year. That didn't happen in 2018 or 2019. The next RENA cycle requires the city in aggregate to produce 8,300 units per year continuously for eight years. Well, how are you going to get to that RENA requirement of 8,300 units per year when in San Jose, before the pandemic, the city was only generating 2,800 units per year average? So there needs to be major course correction and needle moving revisions to city policy if we're going to have enough housing. Thank you. Oscar. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Oscar Castro, Director of Housing and Transportation Justice at Working Partnerships USA. I would like to take this opportunity to both reaffirm the comments provided by my colleague, Louise Auerhan, and add further valuable pieces, pieces to this discussion as we look to combat the numerous impacts that have stemmed from this housing crisis. As we look to propose some solutions to address obstacles to constructions, there must also be a form of accountability in place that San Jose is continuing to meet their housing goals of all income levels. Imbalanced production of housing at the sake of deeper levels of affordability will only result in further income inequality and further heighten the risk of displacement that is taking place throughout the city. In addition, the ULI presentation made mention of modifying forms of tenant protections for the sake of new development. At this current juncture, any modifications to existing tenant protections should be structured in a way that would further support tenants, not add to the extreme vulnerability that renters have faced over the past couple of years. Through this comprehensive study and presentation, there may be more questions and answers as to how we both address hurdles towards production and ensure that we are doing so in an equitable manner, in an equitable manner, excuse me, for the betterment of all residents of San Jose. We look forward for the opportunity to further discuss and contemplate solutions to ensure that we are genuinely addressing this issue while taking all impacts to consideration. Thank you very much. Jeffrey. Yes, thank you very much. Um, First of all, as, as Pam Foley said, this was a, a master class, and I, I want to thank Ro Rosalind Huey and Nancy Klein and the uh, ULI team for really doing a great job in a comprehensive time. A couple of things that I just want to have the, take into consideration, the recent experience in Florida, Hurricane Ian, uh, we saw devastation of a number of homes here in California, not far from us. We've lost during the period of time that Eric Shanehauer was referring to where we barely met the 2,000 house per year, um, that wasn't even a target. We barely were able to create 2,000 homes per year. Uh, we lost over 30,000 homes in the North Bay due to wildland fire. These are, these are types of problems that we're gonna face in the future from flooding, from fire, earthquake, and other events. So I'd like to take a page from the Babcock <coughs> Ranch experiment in uh, Fort Myers and see how we can also focus on sustainable development of housing as well, and not forget that element. And thank you for a great report. I look forward to the uh, 15th. Thank you. Back to the council. Great, thank you. All right, uh, I know council hasn't had an opportunity to ask any questions after the staff report. So, uh, Councilman Cohen. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, and thanks for all of the different presentations today since I didn't ask questions before I appreciate 
that detailed analysis and seeing the details in that analysis um, kind of makes me wonder if we're being too limited in our thinking in the other part of the uh, analysis about what the actions we should take are. I appreciate that this does sound like an urgent problem that we should deal with. On the other hand, I'm, I'm a bit loath to um, make urgent decisions for the long term when we're in, a, in the, what looks like a very poor sit economic situation that could be very short term. We don't really know, obviously, but um, you know, I've been taught not to make investment in other decisions right at, right at, a, at a moment of highest interest rates, low market, all the things that are just right now kind of a perfect storm. So I just want to kind of ask questions about whether we might want to put the brakes on it a little bit to understand what the trends are and what's going to happen and what really are the levers that are going to be most impactful. Um, you know, we're, we're just coming out of the pandemic, which obviously had an effect. There were supply chain issues that obviously had an effect. Um, so I'm concerned about, at this very moment, making what could be a, a decision that impacts other services we can provide as a city. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in on any of that. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking the question about whether you know what's the what's the urgency of this bringing this back in two weeks what parts of it are definitely urgent which parts are not what other levers should we be considering um so anyway i'll i'll, I'll kind of leave it open at that, at that point so um, a lot of the decisions we were mentioning were really longer term. I mean, the, the downtown high-rise program piece is obviously the, the more near term but it is a little bit urgent right now because the, the program, the, the projects have to complete construction by June of 2025. And so really the window is, is really closed for that. They really need to start now or very soon to kind of meet that timeline. So if, if there isn't a decision to extend that program, the effect would be an increase in fees on those, those housing projects. And so I think we feel like it's important not to be adding to, to cost to, to development right now based on the results from the, the study. Okay, I appreciate that. I mean, I see that there's a short-term piece to your recommendation, um, at least based on what I've seen as a preview, but there's also some, some longer-term pieces to the recommendation as well that I'm a little more uncomfortable with at this point. So I just want to kind of throw that out there now, and, and we have some time to think about it between now and, and the 15th. Council Member, may I ask, is there any more specificity so we can know exactly what you're thinking about? Well, I mean, I, I think I saw from a, from a preview that, that I, discussion that I had with you separately about the, the high-rise inclusionary fees for 2020, for two more years, basically. It's a two-year extension on that. Um, is that right? It's two or two-and-a-half-year extension? I, yeah, about two-and-a-half. Two two-and-a-half-year mm -hmm. extension. But there was an additional um, decision in there about inclusionary housing through 2030 two or 33, I forget the exact details. Yeah, so part of the thinking, and this goes back to kind of the panel's discussion about certainty, you know, and the near term versus the long term. And so just, you know, so in the, in the near term, providing that certainty to those developments that might move forward, and then in the long term, signaling to the market where we might be headed in terms of their requirements moving forward. And so messaging that now and having that in place uh, is important. So as they're, as we're emerging from, you know, the, the economic conditions now, you know, they can make plans to accommodate the requirements or fees that we're, um, we're asking for. So that, that's sort of the thinking in, in, in where we're going. We can talk more about it at the, the council meeting. And yeah, I mean, I'm concerned that the analysis we're basing this on is an analysis that says, no matter what we do, nothing's feasible anywhere. So I'm just, I, I just want to understand um, how that kind of jives with the decisions that we're making. I understand that we're hoping that things, conditions are going to improve. We're hoping that people will do what uh, Vice Mayor Jones suggests, which is not overreact at, a, at the current time and understand that if there's long-term profitability to building, that that should at some point exist again and that people aren't going to completely shut down their work. But I, I'm, I, I just, I guess I'm, after the presentation we heard here, I'm a little uncomfortable um, given there were, we heard how complex this is, how many levers there are, how many things. I'm not completely convinced that we've done the analysis that tells us 
that this is the right thing to do at the right time. I, I guess I just put that out there. Council member and mayor, council. I, I, I just wanted to, to pop in. Yeah. I, from staff's point of view, obviously we're, we're at Jennifer's and the council's pleasure. Right now there may be a few projects or a limited number of projects that would go. And if we, in effect, make it yet more costly, they really won't be able to go. So to your point about with everything going on, why do it now? Because in conversations that we have with key developers, they are going to try to go. And Drew mentioned that there are outliers that may want to take a big action in order to impact the market overall. So that is what we're hoping to, to make feasible um, because they are on the bubble. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I've been wondering about since I saw the preview and this presentation today is, and I think I asked this question, but we didn't really have the details. Is it possible to do a height sensitivity analysis to understand, you know, what, you know, we, we have 22 stories, but what does the analysis look like as we change that number? I know that we haven't done that analysis, but is there a way to do that analysis? Drew or one of the panel, maybe you want to? Yeah, I, I can help a little bit. And I, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave in just a moment or two. Um, it's actually my daughter's 16th birthday today. I need to get home for that. Um, <laughs> but I think part of the reason that the analysis looked at uh, 5, 7, 22, there, there was a little bit of magic there. Um, wood frame buildings um, type 5 can typically be built in five stories and are associated with one level of cost. Once you get higher than that, you're into type three wood construction, which has a greater cost per square foot, but you can get greater density. So there's a, a trade-off there. And uh, we did a project in downtown we call the Pierce, which appears to be eight stories, but it's you know two of concrete, um, five of wood, and the very, very top level have loft mezzanine spaces. So there's not an elevator stop at that highest level. That's the extreme that you can do with wood construction. So seven stories nominally, eight if you do that mezzanine. And then everything above that would be type one, which is yet more expensive. And you have to get much taller than eight stories typically to start to make type one. Right. Yeah, and I understand that. I guess I'm also thinking about within the type one, what's the sensitivity analysis? I mean, if it were 24, 25, 20, you know, in other words, I, I know we have height limitations in certain parts of our city. Obviously, we're dealing with that. We, we have places where we don't, maybe don't have the same height limitations. Um, and of course, I'm always interested in North San Jose, but um, what, what can we get some information about what happens as we get above 22 as well? Because this tells us, hey, five's not going to happen, seven's not going to happen, 22's not going to happen. But there might be some height at which it could happen, and I'm curious to know what that would and, be. And that is a legitimate question. It's unfortunate. It's called super high rise. Mm -hmm. Then you have to have another core. Again, yeah, each each height is all driven by fire life seven. safety. Yeah. The higher you go, the more dangerous. So. There is a whole nother layer you can analyze where you get to super high rise, but then it adds more, more inefficiency and costs. Maybe a similar answer. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we, we've framed it around the 22 story because, you know, as downtown, the heights are limited, and um, that's what we've, we've seen because of the airport. Um, I mean, so we, we could look at higher heights. I was also thinking we could, um, so we have the consultant on the line too. They, they might be willing to add a little bit of context here too about adding, adding more height. Um, I don't know if, if one of them wants to, to respond also. They may have some thoughts. Well, maybe not. It's okay. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Here we go. Jake, you want to take that? Yeah, go ahead. This is Jake Kraft on the consultants that did the report. I think the uh, comments that have been made are, are really accurate that as you go up, the costs get higher and that continues as you go up higher at some point it flattens out, but you have to take into account the additional cost uh, when considering the you know additional feasibility you get from having more dense housing. Right, um, I guess I'm, yeah, I mean, I feel <clears throat> obviously it gets more expensive the more you build, but it also the denser, the, the more payoff. So they get, so presumably there's a curve of height to cost to, Payback, not necessarily the cost. Cost will go up, but height to um, the residual or whatever the you know measure we want to use is. Um, um, I just I, I, so. Um, 
I, sorry, I, I just to follow up on Jake's uh, um, comment. Um, yeah, there is a point where the costs do start flattening out in terms of the height. Um, we would have to run some analysis to determine where that is, so that with the additional residential, you do start seeing an increase in uh, value or a, or less negative residual value because your costs are starting to flatten out. But we'd have to run some analysis to determine at what height that would occur. Okay, thank you. Um, just sort of back to the main point, and then I'll wrap it up. I, I'm, you know, given that nothing's, fe this, given this is saying that really nothing's feasible right now, and we're going to have to make some adjustments. We think some things might happen. Um, I'm also concerned about saying, well, we're going to do this. We're going to we're going to push through some some, the, the, or extend what we have going on in downtown to make down some downtown projects feasible, without thinking about what how we're going to make sure that the projects that we have in the pipeline <clears throat> in other parts of the city are going to happen as well. I just want to throw that out there. I'm not sure we have an answer at this moment, but you know, we, we've approved some projects in other parts of the city. Are they going to get built? I don't know. We've also certainly want to get moving soon, hopefully on North San Jose, and I want to make sure that we are thoughtful about what levers we're going to use. I know parking is one. I, I really look, you know, look forward to that conversation. But as I saw, I just, I guess it's back to when I saw the presentation, my my takeaway was this is very complicated and we have a lot of levers and we should really understand what levers are going to have the most impact. And I also want us to be um, consider consider um, the, oh geez, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, I, you know, I just want to make sure that, that um, we're not, we're not so wedded to one type of solution that we're not looking holistically. At, at all of um, you know, at, at, at all of the possible levers. I also think it's really important that, and I know this is partly a staffing issue, but there's procedural things as well that that um, that, that approvals and planning is really important as well. Timelines to make sure that um, we're getting things done as efficiently as possible uh, through whatever means we have to try to. Um, empower developers who are some of the repeat developers, for example, who keep coming back, but we're still, but we, but our process makes it very onerous. So I think we ought to be, you know, I think we ought to be focused on some of these big procedural issues as well as we uh, try to encourage more development in the city. So I, I think I'll just leave it at that uh, for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other members of the council, do we, just about out of time. I, I um, don't see any of the hands. Let me, let me just offer a couple of thoughts. Uh, you know, Councilman McCollum makes a good point that there are other levers. Um, some of those levers we've pulled. <laughs> I mean, parking, we've we've eliminated the minimum. So uh, if, if that's the big lever, we pulled it. Uh, there are others we're still working on. And I know, as Jared described, we've got uh, process improvements coming that will hopefully expedite approvals if the, if the council is willing to do so. And I think there's going to probably be some community pushback on some of that around uh, making um, these decisions ministerial, for example. Uh, it's going to take some courage to, to push forward. Uh, but I th really think this conversation needs to be an and and not an or. Um, we got to do all these things because it's not even a close question for most of these projects as to whether or not they're feasible. We know that what we're looking at is a median or mean picture. But we know the only thing that is going forward are the ones that are really the extreme situations. Maybe they have a very unique source of funding, like a pension fund um, or maybe a, a sovereign fund with very patient money. Maybe they don't pay taxes, like a, if, it's a, um, if it's CalPERS or somebody. Uh, and those are just very unique circumstances. And that's just not where most of the market is in terms of financing. And so I think the reality is all we can hope to do is maybe get one or two out of the ground. If we're talking about downtown. Uh, if that, uh, I think it's probably going to be a long time before we see another. Uh, it's already been since 2017 since we've seen a groundbreaking in downtown. So that's half a decade in the middle of what was perhaps the greatest economic boon this valley has ever seen. Uh, in the heart of this valley, we've seen zero high rises break ground in a half decade, while other cities, Seattle, LA, all throughout the country have seen many dozens. I think we counted 68 cranes in the air in Seattle at one time. At the time we had, I think, one or two. So it's not as though it's a close question here. <laughs> it's a, we are, uh, we don't need to measure the distance to the wall to know we need to jump toward it. We've got to do some jumping because we're just a long way off. And I think we've seen the housing development over the last three or four years 
and the numbers are really, even before the pandemic, 2019, the housing costs were clearly killing us. And I know that there are uh, members of our um, building trades who advocate strongly as they, as they often do, and they, yes, they should absolutely be at the table in these conversations, but the suggestion was, for example, that you know, if we're gonna reduce costs and we ought to have things like local hire. Uh, so let me ask, Drew, you develop both affordable and market rate housing. I know you use labor and uh, non-union, I'm sorry, union, non-union labor. Tell us what local hire is going to do to costs. Yeah, I, yeah. obviously everything around labor is a um, sensitive subject. Um, what, specific to, you know, our experience, we have built non-union projects or open shop. We have built prevailing wage projects and we have built union projects. Um, local hire is, is even a separate policy that it just tends to um, decrease the pool of contractors that you can go to. Um, and so anytime you're decreasing that pool, um, you're decreasing the competition and uh, it allows those that qualify within that pool to, um, you know, with less, with less competition to, um, to bid less aggressively. Um, so what happens to your cost? The costs go up. Obviously. Okay. Um, and, and I can point to an experience um, in a San Mateo County city where uh, a direct policy question, we were buying land from a successor agency post redevelopment. Effectively, the city council and the, and the successor agency were the same group of people um, as often happens. And um, we are currently building a 100% union project. And we're very proud to do it. We're building it with pension fund money from the unions, but that's not what drove that decision. And um, and in the final council hearing, when the land price was being determined, there was an open um, transparency that said, we could pay much more for the land with an open shop construction, or we can pay less for the land with uh, union construction. And the carpenters union and the, the MEP unions were in the room with us, they were supporting us, um, and they spoke for our project. But right before the vote, the mayor of that town made a very clear point to say to the union representatives, we are making a policy decision to support you and we are taking less money for the land so that you can make the wages um, that you're making and that you can support the causes you support. Right. And it's a choice. And like every policy choice we've talked about today, there are costs and benefits. And, and that's a good thing for a city to do many cases when the city owns the land. But I think we know private development in our city doesn't happen on city owned land. I think the only city owned land we use to build housing for the most is, is basically affordable housing. Uh, that, that that is 100% affordable uh, that we're using. So in a world where you don't have a city willing to reduce the price of land, <laughs> how does that affect the viability of construction? Well, it's, it, again, it's a cost question and, yeah. and it's a policy question to the council as to um, if you recognize that that is a cost benefit analysis, um, you have to make a collective choice as to, to which uh, policy you support. Okay. I appreciate and I, it. And I do need to leave. But yeah, I you got to leave. Yeah, you got to go see your daughter. So have fun. <laughs> Wish her a happy birthday for all of us. I, anyway. I'll, I'll make one comment on this because we wrestle with in San Francisco. We do mostly everything all union. It's not the labor rates themselves that we pay the union laborers. It's because they're a smaller pool of contractors. So what they mark up, what the subcontractor companies are actually making versus what we're paying the laborers that's where it becomes less competitive. If we could control the markup in the market, I think it'd be less impactful if we're always using union labor. Thank you. And I've heard similar comments from others who are required to use prevailing wage, uh, that there is a difference whether they're constrained in that way or not. Uh, that even if everybody's getting paid prevailing wage, it, the, the, the issue isn't what the laborers are getting paid or the carpenters, it's, it's this diminished pool of subcontractors right. and what kind of rates they're getting. Right. Yeah. This I'm is sorry. an area where regional advocacy, I think, can really help the city. So um, this, you know, labor was probably until this past year, the number one reason why very few housing laws went through at the state level. They effectively stopped all the conversations there. And we had a few that went through uh, this year, SB6 and AB 2011. So we'll see how those play out. But um, I really uh, hope to see the state legislature support uh, labor 
and try to uh, find some ways uh, so that we can uh, really get at the heart of this issue, which is that there are not necessarily enough workers in the right places for some of these policies to really make sense. Um, we work in 11 counties and the situation is drastically different in Sonoma and, San, uh, and, and Santa Cruz than it is um, here. So I think that there needs to be some investment at the state level uh, and hopefully we can see a little bit of progress if we work together. Agreed, and I certainly welcome a convening by ULI about how we can expand our construction labor pool here in we'll the We'll just region. be at your service for, yeah. uh, ad nauseum. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the agenda's filled up to 2025. <laughs> Too bad I won't be in office, but. Uh, all right, uh, any other comments before we wrap up? Last I, question. I, I did want to go back and yeah. just follow up. I remember the question I was gonna ask, but also something else was triggered by the mayor's comment about Seattle versus San Jose. So let me just understand, I mean, there, there's obviously differences, and are all the differences now between building in places like Seattle versus San Jose, construction costs, um, land costs, those are the two big differences? So, CEQA. Oh, okay, CEQA costs. So we ought to do some advocacy to try to fix that problem as well. I mean, there's other solutions to this, obviously not immediate, but there, there's solutions to this. So the question I was gonna ask was, we were talking about, I know this goes against that whole comment about certainty a little bit, but we're talking about Develop projects that may happen if we were to give some some of this uh, cost reduction in some way. You know, given this menu of things we can do, I, I wonder whether it makes sense to work with developers to say what are the things on this menu of things that will make this project affordable for you, and work on a case by case basis during this particularly challenging time, as opposed to creating long you know any kind of blanket policy that we have to then make projects fit under is, is is this something that is possible so that we could say hey you know what if we what if in this case there's no parking but in this case we're going to waive these fees and in this you know because different projects may have different levers that that affect their costs nancy klein thank you council member for the question please know that a lot of what or much of what we're recommending comes as a result of not only the economics, but being deeply engaged with the developers. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm just, I just want to, you know, I think being uh, creative and nimble is going to be important during this time. And so I just want to throw that also, bring that up as a possibility because I'm, again, I'm hesitant to make decisions that might not be the right ones in two years. Um, but I'm completely aware of, our desire to get projects built um, and want to make sure we find the, the best way to do that. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that whatever you do do on an individual basis, you need to make sure it's fair to all the actors in the development community because once developers perceive that it's not fair, then they're not likely going to do repeat business here. I, I just wanted to add to you, I, the importance of having this report regularly kind of gives you the check-in and ability to know what the conditions are to kind of make those decisions regularly, right? So that you're not necessarily always making these long-term things, not having kind of a, a third-party check on, on what the realities are, right? Maybe I could just add one, one point there that I think in the affordable um, kind of ecosystem that that's very common that you see um, on a deal by deal basis, a lot of this uh, public sector flexibility. Um, when I have a chance to kind of engage with other cities about why to codify some of this, it just speaks to staff time and that many of the, on the affordable side, these innovations that we've come up with, it would just help other projects move more quickly so that you don't end up having to have really complicated development agreements of all, however you structure these agreements, they take time, they take an attorney, um, they take some to the year to hammer it out. So I think if we can kind of land upon some of the um, the broad, the ones that are, apply most broadly, that I think it can end up um, cutting back on that time, the negotiation time. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of time, thank you for being so generous with your time and lending your expertise to us. All right. I think uh, we have exhausted all the questions. So we will now recess. I'm told that there's no open forum for this portion because it's a study session. We will go forward to the rest of the council agenda shortly. So uh, for fans at home, that means we'll be resuming at six o'clock as scheduled on the agenda. Uh, and everyone have a nice break. <laughs>